Cheers. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Mash and Drum Whiskey Room on this Whiskey Wednesday night. What is going on, everybody? Uh, just hanging out, ready to have a drink with you guys. Uh, talk with Greg Metz a little bit. Um, still waiting for him to uh, to pop up here. Uh, I think he's running a little bit late, but doesn't matter. Get to talk to you guys a little bit. Get to talk to you in the chat. Get to talk a little bit of uh, what happened, uh, I think, over the, <laughs> the last week. Uh, hanging out with uh, Scott from my bourbon journey for the Master Journey Whiskey Club picks uh, with a couple people in the uh, in the chat, uh, including the brew baker maker Ernie himself, um, his daughter Kaylin, which uh, we had just a, an, an unbelievable time. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit, but first, want to say a quick hello to everybody in the chat, people hanging out, chilling out. We had uh, Sugar Kitty was here nice and early, Berserker. <laughs> Nick Kentros, what's up, man? Cameron Lochner, uh, Berserker, uh, Roy R. Does Things. What's up, man? We had Big Vic here in the house. What's up, buddy? Whiskey Central, Shayla the Whala. Everybody, please go subscribe to Shayla the Whalo. Uh, did I say Whalo? Shayla the Whalo. <laughs> uh, Kilco Whiskey Musings, what's up? Everyone go check out Kilco Whiskey Musings. Uh, doing some good content there, too. Mike Franklin's here. Uh, Kenny Killingsworth is in the house. Uh, how you doing there? Um, what is up? We also have Rossman Tarver, Donald Rance, the Whiskey Yoda is here. Yes, he is. All right. Oh, looks like uh, Greg Metz has arrived, so we'll bring him in in a second. I see you, Greg. Don't worry, so stay right there. <laughs> uh, we have Old Man Joe is here. Tammy Brennicky, how are you, darling? Nice to see you. Uh, Jeff Perkins, Danny Lynn, uh, and more of you coming in. So, oh, Josh Plowman, Tennessee Jed. Uh, let's see. That's right. Shayla Wayla says Austin Feltz. Donald Rand says, I wish I was home for this. Michelle Martin is here. How you doing, Michelle? Nice to see you. Chris McPhee. So, uh, real quick before we bring on, uh, Greg, uh, had a pretty awesome, uh, last couple days, uh, last week, uh, the last days of the week, I should say we were in. So for the Mash and Journey Whiskey Club, we got to pick an Elijah Craig barrel proof pick. Um, we, we got, we were a little bit nervous cause the first, we only got to choose from three barrels and the first two barrels were pretty crappy. <laughs> and then we got to that third barrel and that one was, uh, kind of magical. So, uh, got to pick that. Then the following day we were with, uh, the brew baker maker, uh, uh, Ernie and, uh, and his daughter, I'm sorry, Dr. Dr. Caitlin Brewbaker, <laughs> uh, who actually helped uh, me and Scott pick out an epic, an epic wilderness trail, single barrel rye I'm telling you guys. I mean, this pick, this rye that's coming out, I cannot wait for it. It is so ridiculously good. The finish on it goes on for days. It's sweet. It's spicy. It's complex. It's, oh, my God, it's so good. Um, so, uh, oh, Edward Fulmer's here. Let's see. IC86. The proof on the ECB pick is about 128, so it's right at almost at 130. So, hey, Whiskey Tornado is here. Uh, Wade Ward is asking, what old elk should I pour? Well, I'm starting actually with the blended straight bourbon. Uh, and we're going to talk to Greg in a second about this. I'm going to pour a little bit more before he comes on. I'll leave this beautiful bottle right here. Also, I really dig the old elk bottle design. Check out the uh, old elk bottle design, guys. There it is, up close and personal. Has the just a badass topper right there, too. Love it. Um... Yeah, everyone's looking forward to that ECBB pick. <laughs> uh, so now tonight's guest is Greg Metz, who you guys may or may, uh, may or may not have ever heard of, but I can promise you is one of the most legendary names of distilling. Why? Well, Greg was with Seagram's, which turned to LDI, which became NGP for almost 40 years. Now, that's right. So all that glorious 95.5 rye, the 10 to 12 years single barrels, that are hundreds of dollars now on secondary, the brands that have been sourcing from MGP for years. Well, Greg distilled and laid down many of those barrels of whiskey years ago before bottles that say on the back, distilled in Indiana, ever became fixtures on our whiskey shelves. Uh, he also specialized in developing bourbon whiskeys, rye whiskeys, exotic whiskeys, batch light whiskeys, gin, vodka, and more. Uh, today, Greg is using those years of whiskey development at Old Elk based in Fort Collins, Colorado crafting rye bourbon, weeded bourbons, wheat whiskey, and offering some great single barrels, which we will get into. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome uh, Greg Metz. And there he is. Hey, hello everyone. How you doing, Greg? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. 
Thanks for coming in. I really appreciate uh, your time and uh, coming in. Uh, I want to say welcome to the Master Drum Whiskey Room. I was looking at my shelves today and thinking, my goodness, how many bottles of whiskey do I have that Greg probably distilled? <laughs> has the has the popularity today of MGP and some of the stuff you distilled within those 38 years at Seagram's or MGP, has, has that really sunk in at all? Uh, it has in the last five years, actually. Uh, yeah. Actually, you know, you had mentioned before I came on that, you know, we went through some ownership changes, but yeah. Uh, in 2008, when we became LDI, uh, that's really when the facility uh, became 100% contract distillers. Uh, we had lost all brand affiliation uh, with uh, the products that Pernover Car acquired and the uh, products that Diageo uh, acquired in 2002 when Seagram's got out of the business. So yeah. uh, we went from probably uh, maybe a half a dozen contracts in 2008 to probably uh, a couple hundred by the time MGP took over four and a half years later. So we uh, really actively pursued uh, third party contracts uh, during that four and a half years and, and really uh, for all practical purposes broke the stigma that, uh, you know, bourbon had to be, uh, had to be made in Kentucky. Uh, Kentucky bourbon obviously has to, but bourbon actually can be made in any of the 50 states and i think lawrence bird and ldi did a lot to dispel uh you know that myth over the over that four and a half year period yeah i mean i would agree with you i think indiana bourbon in general uh mgp in general <clears throat> ldi secret i think all of that stuff had definitely changed a little bit of the stigma of source whiskeys because i mean this stuff was just so damn good um you know you were a big part of that so tell us about your beginnings where you grew up, I mean, I know a career in whiskey wasn't really in the plans for you, was it? I mean, tell us, tell us how that happened and how you were introduced to the world of, uh, of whiskey. Sure. So uh, it really started in 1978, spring of 1978. Uh, I was finishing up my engineering degree. I had, was finishing up a chemical engineering degree at the University of Cincinnati. And, uh, of course, way back then, the companies actually came to campus to recruit uh, for open positions that they had at their facilities. And as it was, uh, Joseph E. Seagram's and Sons was uh, on campus looking to fill uh, positions that they had open at the Lawrenceburg, Indiana distillery. So uh, I actually grew up in Western Hills, uh, Cincinnati. So I was familiar with the plant. I'd been by it, you know, quite often, uh, you know, throughout my uh the years that I grew up and uh, teenage years and even college years. So I was, I was really familiar with the facility, but, uh, you know, only from the standpoint that it really smelled good when you drove by it. Uh, <laughs> and, and beyond, so good. <laughs> and beyond that, I really, uh, I, di I didn't really have any concept of, you know, the processes or you know, frankly, I didn't even know what a master distiller was. So uh, the long story short is that uh, I went through that interviewing process I uh, was fortunate to have been offered a job, and uh, uh, two weeks later, I walked in the gate of that big facility, and I think, wow, this is this is pretty damn cool. I'm I'm 23 years old. I'm going to work <laughs> work for a company that makes whiskey, and and uh, here I am. So it was really, uh, in many ways, uh, pure dumb luck on on how I got into the industry. Uh, uh, the, and the part that I really didn't know was that I was going to get the best training in the world. Uh, relative to becoming a master distiller from uh, Joseph E. Seagram's and Sons, uh, they had. Well, so, so what was so what was your first job? Uh, at the time, it was Seagram. So what was your first job at Seagram's? Well, uh, part of their training program uh, was it that, that uh, you you came in regardless of who you who you were, what your degree was in, uh, how old you were. Uh, you mm -hmm. started. You, everybody started as an entry level. Uh, manager. So for me, uh, I started as the uh, electrician and uh, coppersmith supervisor. So at that time, the facility was had 13 different bargaining units. Uh, we had literally every uh, craft trade in the business. And uh, my first job was to supervise the, uh, the electrician group and the, uh, and the coppersmith group. But uh, part of the Seagram training program was that, that really you, uh, they, they expected you to migrate through every department in, in the plant 
so that you would get a perspective of, you know, how the different departments uh, work together, how they have to work together relative to putting a uh, world-class whiskey out the door every yeah. day. So, uh, you know, from that standpoint, uh, I actually had probably 10 different jobs before I moved into production proper uh, from between 1978 and uh, 2002 when I, uh, finally uh, acquired the master distiller position so uh you know for wow, me yeah that's fascinating i i would i would imagine in a in a facility that big i mean that's got to be really the only way to do it you start at one point you get to know different departments and by the time you run through all those jobs not only do you know everything about the distillery but you know pretty much everyone that works there so i'm i mean how important were personal relationships as you wait, made your way through uh through uh through the pipeline into you know when, eventually till you got to distilling well, I mean, as uh, as you would expect, it was it was uh, a really a key part of of being able to succeed. Uh, you know, uh, going through all the different departments. Obviously, you learned uh, you know how they how how they interacted. But then, as you say, you you got to uh, craft relationships with all those groups. But mm -hmm. uh, really, more than anything, it was it was really uh, about learning and honing uh, people management skills. I mean, coming out of uh, University of Cincinnati with a chemical engineering degree, I, I literally had zero uh, people management skills. So uh, I, <laughs> you learn you learn real fast. <laughs> yeah, a lot of their training, a lot of their training was to throw you into the fire and see, uh, see how you did. And, uh, you know, that was really part of their method was was to test you early and uh, uh, test you fiercely. And, uh, uh, you know, at the age of 23, and I'm, I was supervising probably a group of uh, 30 or 35 folks that were my dad's age, uh, and they were all very seasoned, uh, very highly skilled craftsmen, uh, you know, in, in the union trade. So it's, that was, uh, that was a real uh, eye-opening experience uh, for me at, at that young age. And, so, again, so, one, so once you became master distiller, and was it, was it still Seagram's or was it LDI at that point when you became master distiller? It was, uh, we were just changing hands. So, uh, okay. Seagram, Seagram's uh, uh, sold in 2002 and we were just coming under the ownership of uh, Preneur Car at the facility. Okay. Uh, so, when you started distilling, what... At what scale of whiskey making were you thrown into? I mean, are we talking rye, bourbon, neutral grain spirits, and everything else, or were products like the famous ninety-five-five mash bill still kind of an afterthought or a focus? No, it was all. It really was all uh, pretty much all at once. Now, you know, uh, I had worked. Uh, I got put into production proper in nineteen ninety-two, so that's really when I started. Uh, really my tenure training uh, to become the master distiller. All, mm -hmm. all my uh, jobs prior to that were in all the other uh, departments within the plant. So uh, it was it was a very um, uh, thought out process. My, my first job in production was uh, the dry house coordinator. We had a, a substantial uh, dry house that uh, uh, dried all the spent slop from the beer stills into, into cattle feed. Uh, so I spent a, a year and a half in that position, and that was a really maintenance-intensive, uh, uh, highly uh, prone to breakdown position. Mm -hmm. and, and that particular job, if 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 you were down more than say two hours uh, in in the dry house portion, uh, it, it affected the the entire distiller distillery within two hours. You'd be slowing the cooker down or shutting the cooker <laughs> down. And it was, uh, you know, a very uh, high profile uh, position relative to, uh, you know, keeping that part of the business running. So I, I, rec I recently just learned what a dry house was. Actually, I was at uh, I was at the new Bullet Distillery and they they have one there. Yeah. Um, so for those of you guys that don't know a dry house, dry house is where. So usually what they do with the leftover mash after distillation is they'll they'll take that and they'll give it to farmers for cattle feed. Um, but if you don't have a dry house, you have to do that pretty fast before it goes bad. A dry house allows them to take the leftover mash and um, or slurry, if you will, and kind of throw it in a in this dry house for it to be dried and packaged so they can give it to the farmers and 
you know, it'll, you know, it'll last a lot longer. So, I mean, in turn, that probably paid for itself, didn't it, Craig? Oh, yeah, actually, uh, well, it, it varied, actually. There, there were years where it was profitable. There was years where it was break even, and there was years uh, when it wasn't profitable. But at, at the end of the day, you had to get that product out of the plant to keep running. So we, yeah. we, were, we were processing uh, probably 17,000 bushels a day. Uh, we were probably running uh, combined probably uh, 30,000 gallons of mash an hour. So uh, it, it was a, a massive facility and there was no way that you could uh, get rid of that much slop on a continuous basis. <laughs> so it, it was essential that you had a dry house and it was essential that 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 part of the uh, so, uh story ran no absolutely um mm -hmm. so if you guys have any questions in the chat that you want to throw at greg real quick before we get into our next set of questions please do i saw some questions flying by here a lot of people had a lot of questions for you um so we'll make sure those get those get thrown in for everyone um uh, I, I I saw a uh, question come up earlier here. Let me if I can go back for it. Um, oh, so it was about light whiskey. So all the light whiskeys that we're seeing nowadays, uh, you know, we're seeing some 12, 14-year-old, even 16-year-old light whiskeys that are coming out of MGP that are getting either used in blends or also being bottled for uh, for sale. Some mm -hmm. have some finishes on it. What was your what was your experience with uh, light whiskey? Did you work on those a good amount? Well, Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, one of the things about, uh, one of the things that, that I was so fortunate uh, in my career was that I, I got to learn every aspect of distillation. So I, as you said earlier, I learned uh, everything about bourbon and rye whiskeys, but then I learned how to, how to make neutral grain spirits, which is entirely different than making whiskey. Uh, yeah. Uh, made, made substantial amounts of gin. All the Seagram gin that was made in the, in the world was made, and it's probably still made in Lawrenceburg, Indiana. And then that batch light whiskey is a product that uh, was a, uh, a really big uh, percentage of the uh, Seagram Seven Crown blend for many, many years. And we produced, uh, oh, we probably produced 10 million proof gallons of that a year. There wow. Was. Holy crap. Uh, so, and it, it's a, it was, uh, you know, on the quality table, uh, at least in the white distillate, when we evaluated uh, everything that we made the day prior to, to see if it was worthy of going into a barrel, yeah. it was, actually, was actually one of my favorites on the table. It had a really nice uh, light chocolate uh, flavor uh, to it. So it was very pleasing. Uh, and it was, it was uh, based on a, uh, a spirit mash bill. A, a neutral grain spirit mash bill. So the mash bill was 99% corn and 1% malt. Uh, we distilled it uh, uh, just below 190 proof, and it was distilled on a, on a massive uh, column and kettle. Uh, it was the kettle was 40,000 gallons. Wow! And, and the uh, the column had uh, 50, 50, 55 trays in it, if memory serves me right. So is, is, li is light whiskey primarily always aged in a used barrel? Yes, yes, okay. uh, and I think that's uh, that's a TTB requirement. Okay, okay. And the the proof has to be uh, one eighty nine point nine or below, which is a TTB requirement. Oh, interesting. So, so the light the light part comes. It's not calorie based, but it's actually light in flavor. So we would actually do a uh, partial heads cut at the beginning. And then uh, we would do a, a total tails cut at the end. So you, you would just have a very lightly flavored distillate. And again, for me, it, it came across as a very light uh, chocolate uh, type note that was really quite pleasing. I always thought I always thought it was interesting with the popularity of light whiskey today and how it's coming back and people are using it in uh, multiple blends nowadays. But, you know, back then, that's not what light whiskey was originally used for. I mean, they were trying to make light whiskey to appease you know, the, you know, non-bourbon drinkers in the seventies and eighties to get back into whiskey. Yes. Which I thought was really interesting. Yeah. Um, Barrel Lover kicking off the super chats tonight. Uh, just so you know, guys, tonight I am giving away uh, two bottles of old elk tonight. Uh, so any super chats that come in, uh, you get in the running to win two bottles. I'm going to, uh, I'll have a, a weeded bourbon for you and also the blended bourbon in case none of you can get it near you. 
So you guys can uh, super chat away. And uh, if any of you mods in there can keep track of the names, we'll give away two bottles later. Um, so let's see here. We've got some other ones. Uh, uh, yep, we answered that question. So Barrel Lover says, love me some old elk wheat store picks in my tastings. Always beats Weller 107. <laughs> uh, yeah, go ahead. And yeah, we, uh, uh, we're really quite proud of uh, really – uh, all the different mash bills that uh, we offer with uh, Old Elk, but the uh, the wheat whiskey and the wheated bourbon has really just came out uh, to market very early this year. So it's it's gaining; they're both gaining traction uh, quickly. And uh, uh, again, they're they are uh, completely custom mash bills, and they are extreme uh, relative to the wheat content uh, compared to other other uh, wheated products on the shelf. So uh, Old old Elk is really uh, built and prides itself on on being different than everybody else. Uh, and that's really how how and why uh, all the different mash bills were crafted uh, with that intent. Um, so so now, I mean, let's get into these all these non-distilling producers. Oh, wait, we have one more question here. Greg, do you blend in addition to distilling? If so, what do you enjoy more? Uh, actually, it's a good mix. Uh, uh, so I've got uh, all, all the, uh, really all the blends uh, that we put out. Uh, I do, uh, right, I, I, I put them together right here at my house. I still live in Cincinnati, um, st which is uh, still very really close to MGP, which is where everything that I produce for Old Elk is still being aged. So I'll, I'll order barrel samples and then I'll, I'll bring them here to the house. I'll, I'll evaluate them for quality, and then uh, once they pass that test, uh, then then I either uh, put together the blends for uh, what goes into the bottle, or I choose the ones that uh, will go into the single barrel programs that we have. Yeah, so speaking of single barrel programs, guys, uh, kind of going to let you know that uh, tomorrow night, Greg is going to be back on the channel, same time. And uh, we're going to be picking an old elk weeder for the Mash and Journey Whiskey Club. So that's what these boxes are here. Um, from old elk, we have some uh, some beautiful samples all wrapped up, ready to go. Cool. Uh, Todd uh, Todd Ritter, who's in the chat, and also Dan and Julie Like will be uh, helping out with the picks. So tune in t tomorrow night, guys. Uh, Greg, you might need to help us uh, walk through <laughs> the weeders. To see, uh, oh, absolutely. How and what we're going to pick. We're, we're really looking forward to it. Um, Whiskey Nose says, what is Greg's favorite batch yet of Old Elk? Whichever it is, I need an autograph bottle. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Uh, uh, that, that's really uh, an impossible question. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, you know, um, you know, every, every batch has its own fingerprint uh, and, and it makes every batch <laughs> becomes unique really amongst itself so you know what 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 my goal is, is is not really to try to blend to uh special uh sensory and, and special descriptors my focus and my training really uh with seagrams was really more about uh was was looking at the quality of the distillate before it went into the barrel to yes. make to make yeah. sure that uh you know, it has to be good going into the barrel to be good coming out. Uh, one of the things I tell people all the time is that uh, a, a barrel will make good whiskey better, but it will not make bad whiskey good. So, uh, you know, the uh, a core, uh, the, some of the core training that I received from was from Seagram's was 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 very intense uh, quality related. Uh, type training. Uh, Seagram's was incredibly anal about uh, quality. And, and one of the things about that facility that probably a lot of people don't know is that uh, if, if, if a whiskey uh, didn't, didn't meet the quality uh, to go into a barrel, uh, it didn't go into a barrel. We actually redistilled it into vodka. So oh, wow. That's interesting. <laughs> Seagram's never barreled a bad, a bad whiskey product. Uh, um, speaking of that, uh, Adam Dorman has a good question. Loving my old elk weeded uh, store pick. My 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 wife loves Seagrams. Did Diageo change it at all from when it was produced in Indiana? Uh, I I would have no way of knowing that. I uh, I don't know. 
Actually, uh, actually, Seagram's Seven Crown, like it, it migrated uh, uh, a lot just over the 24 years that I was part of Seagram. So it it went from uh, it went from a, a a lot of straights and and a reasonable amount of light whiskey, batch light whiskey, uh, early on, uh, and then later on, of course, the dynamics of that change because of pricing and and uh, you know more competitive markets and whatnot. So it it yeah. uh, it, it became uh, it, it it started to contain some neutral grain spirits uh, later in in later later years. So the, the the answer the short answer is that yeah the formula changed uh, quite a bit uh, over the twenty four years that I was part of Seagrams. And by and by the way you're you're saying about you know a barrel can't make a bad whiskey good. <laughs> That that needs to be on like the Greg Metz like T-shirt like yeah, <laughs> forever. Yeah, <laughs> no, like it's it's very true. It's uh, yeah. Uh, there, yeah, there people are yeah, people don't realize if you don't make good distillate, if you don't know where to you know to cut it, and uh, and I I do want to get into heads and tails a little bit uh, in a little while, but absolutely, I, I did want to ask you: Do all these NDPs with contrived stories and reincarnated labels? Making off making money off of whiskey you distilled bother you at all, or you know, because it's stuff that you lay down without the credit at the time. Um, you know how how do you how do you feel about that in today's market, or is just you know to you it's just it's good whiskey and people are buying it and enjoying it. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, you know for me, I don't know people that have been around me uh, know it, but probably a lot of people don't know it. I mean, by nature, I'm uh, a very humble person. And, yeah, and. And the other thing about me is that my personality is really uh, wired for uh, self gratification. So yeah, uh, for me, like on a weekend, I can I can go out in a really messy, dirty garage, and I can spend all day Saturday cleaning it up. And at the end of the day, I can look at that and feel a tremendous amount of accomplishment and pride, knowing that that I you know took something messy, cleaned it up and you know accomplish something so you know really for me uh every day i left that distillery regardless of of who we were producing for on any given day yeah. uh, I, knew, I knew when i walked out of that distillery that i was producing world-class whiskey and uh you know that that's where my gratification come came from i i knew that what we were producing uh was going to be put to very good use under many, many brands, uh, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, you know, the notoriety wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, a driver for me. I, you know, I've obviously, uh, I've uh, become more notable over the years, but yeah, uh, and yeah. it's fun. I, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to say I don't enjoy it, but it's, it's never really been a, a primary driver for me. Uh, and listen, any, any interview or any, uh, or any, any interview I heard or podcast I heard with you, I kind of expected that answer, but I still wanted to ask because yeah. I, I knew you're kind of like the, you're like the most legendary, but every man's master distiller that's out there, which is, which is great. I, I did have a question though about, so let's, so sourcing when NDPs were sourcing from you guys and you had just a massive amount of whiskey, you were making a massive amount of barrels. Um, were there specific areas in the warehouse you had reserved for them or did NDPs come in with specific flavor profiles in mind with the goal to find something unique for their, whether it be a single barrel or a blend? Like how, how is that even managed? I always, I always wondered in my head, man, with all these NDPs and people trying to look for something specific, I mean, are they just pulling from specific parts of the warehouse? Do you, do you have to pay to play? Do you got to pay a little bit more to get to some of the more premium ricks? How did that all work? Well, I mean, uh, first and foremost, really, MGP uh, didn't really uh, purchase any products uh, uh, from us, uh, and probably didn't lay any products down until they owned the facility. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, so there wasn't any, uh, there wasn't, you know, prior to them taking ownership of the plant, we we really never produced anything for MGP, but. Uh, to your point, uh, obviously, you know, every warehouse has its sweet spots and, uh, you know, Lawrenceburg warehouses are built entirely different than uh, most other warehouses that you'll find. How so? Well, well, it's really, that has to do with the structure. Uh, okay. if, if you've ever seen pictures of that facility or whatever, they're, they're 
they're all primarily 50,000 barrel rick houses. Yeah. Uh, at least they were before I left. I think, I think, uh, you know, other warehouses have been built since I left, but, uh, anyway, uh, they were really, uh, uh, like bomb, built like bomb shelters. Uh, the walls were two foot thick masonry and they had probably one thick uh, concrete floors between every floor. So they were six high and, and in a lot of cases, uh, a basement and a sub basement. So they had a total of maybe eight floors, <laughs> but they were all separated by, uh, you know, every mass of concrete floors and they were all surrounded by uh, uh, two foot thick uh, masonry walls. As opposed to uh, Kentucky type warehouses that are really uh, just a structure of timber with barrels and then sheeted with uh, uh, sheet metal protected from the weather. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the, the large bird warehouses uh, act like more of a big battery. So you would have more gradual day to day shifts in temperature and, and more gradual shifts uh, season to season than you might see in Kentucky. And I'm not here to say that one's better than the other, but I'm just, I'm just here to say that uh, they're different. And, <laughs> and I think, uh, and, and one thing that's really interesting and that the climates uh, be, uh, between Lawrenceburg, Indiana and Kentucky is, is uh, they're, they're pretty, uh, pretty much the same. We get the same high humidity. We get the same seasonal changes and yeah, and uh, the same day-to-day -day swings that uh, you know both those territories get. But uh, what's interesting is that in Lawrenceburg, Indiana, uh, for all practical purposes, uh, the barrels as they matured always lost proof. Where in Kentucky, they always gain proof. So there's uh, there must be differences in vapor pressure, and, and maybe the style of warehouses affects it too. But uh, you know, Lawrenceburg, the the affinity was for uh, you know, the uh, conditions to take the uh, the alcohol uh, molecule off and uh, Kentucky has a tendency to take the water molecule off. But Yeah, I, I, think, again, I think I think people tend to forget that the the limestone shelf does not end in Kentucky. <laughs> oh, no, no. Uh, it goes right up. It goes right up into Indiana. So anyone in Kentucky thinking you can't make bourbon anywhere else that that limestone shelf is not exclusive to uh, to Kentucky. No, and that's the uh, that's that's the uh, exact reason why that Larchburg distillery is built where it's at. It it sits on top of a underground aquifer, which is all limestone filtered water. Yep. And uh, the water stays fifty six degrees year round, so you get chilled water for free. Uh, and like you say, it's very pure, no iron, no sulfur. And we were using uh, about seven million gallons a day out of that aquifer when I left. So wow, it's, that's incredible! <laughs> you need a massive amount of water to run a, a, a distillery. <laughs> uh, so Shem Coward has a quick uh, question. Greg, can you share the role the limestone water plays during the fermentation phase? Do they reserve osmosis filter it away? Uh, no, actually, the uh, the hardness, uh, the water, the limestone, uh, the yeah, the limestone filtered water is very high in calcium, uh, mm -hmm. it's, uh, which is hardness. So it's it's really tough on the uh, condensers and whatnot uh, for the distillation. You have to acid clean them every year to to remove that to keep the efficiency up. But the uh, the calcium and the minerals in in the aquifer water is uh, is is uh, really essential to good fermentation. It, it uh, it provides minerals and vitamins for the yeast, which is uh, a big deal. Wow. And uh, uh, it also it also helps with the uh, the catalytic action of, of the enzymes that you use and uh, and uh, and other things. So it's uh, we we when we mash we mashed and fermented uh, with water uh, directly out of the aquifer uh, when we when we made water for the boiler and we made water to cut from uh, barrel proof to bottling proof, uh, that was all, that was all, uh, demineralized water or RO water. So yeah, there's, there's certain things that you have to filter out all the hardness and all the minerals, uh, so that you can operate your boiler and so that you can reduce proof, uh, for bottling, but, uh, all, all the process water, uh, that we use for the distillation towers and cooker and, and fermentation all was, pumped directly out uh, of the aquifer and used untreated. 
So I wanted to ask you, you know, for the chat and everybody watching, um, the importance of heads and tails when it comes to, I think it's a term, if you go on a, uh, if you go on a bourbon tour uh, or if you go on a whiskey tour, they talk about it a lot. Um, kind of go, kind of go through the heads, tails, making those cuts, getting, getting that middle ground. So it's kind of the perfect whiskey you're looking for and, and how you go about looking for the, you know, exactly where to cut it. Well, that's a, uh, that's a great question. And, um, I will tell you that, uh, the, the degree of those cuts is really, uh, it's really based on how good your fermentation is mm -hmm. and what type of yeast you use. So uh, uh, the whole key to making any world-class whiskey is, is all, it's, it's all in the fermentation. Mm -hmm. uh, so whatever happens in that fermenter is going to translate to the bottle, whether it's good or whether it's bad. Exactly. Uh, really, uh, the distilling part for whiskey is really straightforward and it's really quite simple. All you're really, primarily doing is transferring all the congeners that you develop in that fermenter and flavors. And, and really you're just transferring them to the bottle. You're really not doing any fractional distillation to separate components so much. So if you have really good fermentation, uh, then the amount of cuts that you have to take are going to be much smaller. Um, and, and frankly speaking, uh, we didn't really do any, uh, planned heads or tails cuts uh, when I was there. Uh, we we wow. ran we ran uh, a, a continuous beer still. Uh, we didn't really take any uh, formal heads cuts or tails cuts. We operated uh, the way we operated the column was extremely steady. Uh, we did do some really minor things to take away some of the sloppy characteristics that you might find, which you know, you could technically call it a, a very mild tails cut. Mm -hmm. And we operated some of the condensers such that there was always a little bit of uh, vapor bleeding to atmosphere, which technically could be called a very minor heads cut. So okay. uh, we didn't really, uh, you know, under, under my uh, leadership, uh, and that's really the way I was trained, is, was we operated the, the continuous beer still and, and really uh, – didn't take any formal heads or tails cut. So we, we were very, um, we, we monitored fermentation uh, every day, every day and adjusted, adjusted things in the fermenter every day so that we, so that we uh, wouldn't have to take, uh, you know, a formal heads cut or a formal tail, tails wow. cut. That's incredible. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, you you said, I mean, from water to grain to what happens in the fermenter, all that stuff, you know, plays a huge role before it ever gets into a barrel, and making sure that you guys can, you know, get exactly what you uh, what you what you're looking for. Um, so, so let me ask you. This might be a really tough question, but <laughs> do do you have a favorite brand that you helped create, or a specific product or mash bill that you were really proud of while you were at, you know, Seagram's LDI? Uh, um, no, I really, uh, I didn't really have my first opportunity to craft custom mash bills until I met old elk. So that, that was, uh, uh, probably seven years ago. Uh, now when they first came to, I was still master distiller, uh, at, at MGP when I met old elk and, uh, that, that was my first opportunity. They, uh, they came to the plant. They wanted to get uh, in the bourbon business, but they wanted to be different than everybody else on the shelf. Mm -hmm. And we're asking for uh, custom mash bills, not the four or five uh, standard mash bills that we were really producing for everybody else. And those four or five mash bills were really derivatives of uh, all the Seeger mash bills that went into all the Seeger brands. Uh, just so happens they were all world-class whiskey. Uh, yeah. They were, they yeah. were all, all great mash bills. Uh, but they were, they weren't, they weren't necessarily different than, than anybody else on the shelf. So, so, so that's, that's a perfect segue as we transition now into old elk, you were a master distiller, you know, at MGP when old elk distillery came knocking on your door in 2013. Mm -hmm. Um, they had asked you to create signature mash bills for the old elk blended straight bourbon whiskey, uh, you know, old elk's founder, who's uh, Kurt Richardson. Right. Um, tell us, tell us how the old elk brand and idea was presented to you and, 
why you chose to take your talents to uh, to Colorado. <laughs> I mean, I, I know you still live in Cincinnati, but how did that all happen? Well, uh, you know, if, if you probably haven't met, met Kurt Richardson. And as you say, he was he's a uh, an exceptional entrepreneur. Obviously, mm -hmm. he, he hit a grand slam with Otterbox phone covers, and that was all really uh, derived right from his garage. So uh, he, he started... He started that business uh, literally from the ground up and, uh, you know, became very successful in that venture. And, uh, you know, that entrepreneurial mentality, uh, you know, just carries through to other businesses that he has. Mm -hmm. So, you know, eight years ago, he uh, decided he thought it'd be, uh, be nice to get into the into the craft whiskey business. And uh, uh, in doing so, then, you know, they did some homework and they decided uh, you know, to come to MGP to, to lay down a lot of inventory while, you know, while they built the brand and while they, uh, you know, eventually uh, hope to build a full scale distillery and uh, to support their brands once they build it. But, uh, you know, when they came to me seven years ago, uh, again, the, the DNA of the company, which is really uh, brought forward from Kurt is to be different than everybody else. So, uh, you know, when we met, he said, uh, we want a, uh, a custom bourbon mash bill and, mm -hmm. and we want the product to be smooth and easy. That was it. That, that's the two words he gave me to work with. So, and again, uh, as I said earlier, that was my first opportunity in my career. And at that point I was, uh, what, 36 years in, uh, to actually craft custom mash bills from the ground up unrestricted, mm -hmm. unrestricted, uh, uh, relative to cost. So uh, to hit smooth and easy, I then, you know, at that point, I just leveraged my experience. Uh, and I, I knew to get smooth and easy, I had to get the malted barley content way up in the bourbon. Mm -hmm. uh, in the back of my mind, I also knew that all the other mash bills that I'd produced in my career up to that point always had some degree of rye in it for that really nice little spice characteristic. Yes. And, and, and to get that character to, to carry through into the distillate, it takes a minimum of 15% rye. So uh, really from there, it was reverse math. I, I took the corn content in the bourbon uh, mash bill to the minimum, 51%. Uh, I factored in the 15% rye to get that little spice note. And that left me room for 34% molten barley. So, uh, you know, relative to uh, other bourbons on the shelf, that 34% barley is... Uh, probably five or six times higher than anything you'll find anywhere on the show. Yeah, I mean, norm normally when you're reading mass bills, it's seven, 78, 12%, and maybe 2% barley, you know, when, you, yeah. when you're looking at those mass bills. So when I read your mass bills, and um, I'm going to start here with the blended straight bourbon, uh, which has that mash bill that, that Greg was just talking about, uh, when we're talking about 51 corn, 15% rye, and 34% barley, this is a blended straight bourbon. It's at 88 proof. And I got to say, for an 88 proofer, <clears throat> this has a nice little spiciness on the back end that I did not expect. Um, it's, it's very sweet on the nose. You definitely get a little bit. Now, I could get a little bit of like a burnt toast note, for, I think, from that high barley. <laughs> There's a there's a slight like chocolatey toasty note that's uh, that's on the nose of this one, but on the palate, there's a really beautiful spice and complexity to it for an 88 proofer. Um, was that by design? The proof was very intentional on my part. Again, that uh, uh, you know they they uh, the two terms they gave me to work with were smooth and easy. Uh, we wanted the proof to be in the premium category, and we wanted uh -huh. the, the bourbon to be in a premium category relative to proof. So. Uh, but I didn't want the proof so high that it started interfering with the smooth and easy characteristics that, yeah. that, uh, that we worked so hard to get. So uh, the 88 proof uh, was where we uh, set the mark. And that, again, that was very intentional. You know, if I've got uh, just a minute, just to give you a perspective, uh, when I had mentioned that, you know, I wasn't restrained by cost. Yeah. And like you said, most, most other bourbons have, just a small amount of barley in them. And, and there's a big reason why. So it, it, it's all, it's all based on cost of the grain and the yield that you'll get from the grain. So the so corn is, is the most common uh, of all cereal grains. Uh, I just, I just want to, 
I just want to tell everybody before you keep going, everyone get their notebooks out. You're going to want to write this down because I'm. we're all learning right here. So, all right, go ahead, Greg. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> no, no, no issues at all. And, uh, again, I, I always welcome questions, so feel free. But, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, corn's the most abundant. It's easiest to get. It's the cheapest. Okay. It, also, it also has the highest starch content of all cereal grains. It yeah. runs 70 72%. And starch is the only part of the cereal grain that you can convert into alcohol. Um, and the other uh, 27% uh, is either water or minerals or vitamins uh, or things that just aren't fermentable into uh, alcohol. So uh, so if you're going to build a mash bill and you want to keep it cheap, you want to maximize the corn. So if you go to the next next grain, rye, that, that's probably going to run uh, 8 or $9 a bushel. So it's going to be double. Yeah, but and the starch content is going to be sixty or sixty-two percent, so you're going to get less proof gallons per bushel because there's less starch in that. Less, yeah, less starch to convert to sugar. Yes. Okay. So then, then we jump to malted barley. That's probably <laughs> twenty-five dollars a bushel. <laughs> okay. And the starch content of that is in in the low sixties or low to oh, low sixties. Okay. And now so, and now when when distillers talk about barley, especially from a Kentucky perspective, you hear that barley they're not really using it too much for flavor. They're using it for the enzymes to help convert starch to sugar. Yes. Now, exactly. so you're going all in here. You're at thirty four percent barley. So tell us the reasoning. You know why. Well, again, that, that was to get the smooth and easy characteristics that, uh, that, that Kurt had asked for. So, uh, you know, I guess one of the best comparisons uh, that I can give people uh, relative to malted barley is if you've ever had a malted milkshake, yeah. it's kind of sweet and, mm -hmm. uh, and flavorful. Uh, so those, those are the kind of characteristics. Uh, malted barley and malted milk are really the same thing. It's, it's, it's ground up. Uh, malted barley. So uh, those are the type of characteristics that uh, are imparted into the distillate as a result of uh, that particular cereal grain and the amount of that cereal grain. So so it's so this is a uh, so you could, this is a pretty expensive mash pill. <laughs> uh, yeah, if, yeah, relative relative to others that are on yeah, the market. Yeah, relative to others. Um, uh, so can you tell us about wheat now? So what what type of, uh, you know, what are we looking at for uh, wheat content and bushel cost? How does wheat play into it? All right. So uh, wheat, wheat is uh, um, somewhat comparable to corn relative to starch, but it's more expensive. Okay. So, uh, so af after, I, after we crafted the uh, old elk uh, high malted barley bourbon mash bill, I think I laid down maybe eight or 10,000 barrels of that for Old Elk when I was still there. Mm -hmm. uh, after we completed that part of the project, then, then uh, Old Elk came back and, and we roundtabled again. And at that point, they were saying or thinking, you know, what do you think is going to be popular seven or eight years down the road, which is pretty much where we're at now. And, uh, you know, when we talked at that point in time, why rye whiskey, uh, especially the 95%, that we were producing in Lawrenceburg was was a, a, a smash hit and gaining traction big time. Uh, but also at that time, they, you know, there was some very nice weeded bourbon and weeded whiskeys on the market. But uh, mm -hmm. for all practical purposes, that that market was was relatively untapped. So as we talked, I I thought that we should craft some uh, a weeded bourbon and, and a weeded whiskey for Old Elk, but but take it to the extreme, uh, which is what we did. So uh, if you want, if you look at the weeded bourbon mash bill, again, I took the corn content to the minimum, 51%. I took the wheat content to 46%, and uh, I, I still needed 4% malt to get conversion, like you mentioned earlier. So yeah, uh, from, a, from a weeded bourbon perspective, that, that's about the maximum amount of wheat. Uh, that you can get into a weeded bourbon mash bill. Which yeah, is this is not. This isn't like uh, like twenty percent wheat or some of the wheat that you see. I mean, we're we're at forty. What do you say, forty six percent wheat in this mash bill? Yeah, and you could and you could smell every bit of that wheat. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually enjoying a, uh, a weeded bourbon uh, single barrel tonight. So, 
Yeah, well, I, I can't wait to dive into the single barrels tomorrow night. Um, I'll show you guys real quick uh, what we got going on tomorrow night. Greg is going to be on the channel again, uh, and we're going to be picking uh, an Old Elk live single barrel selection. Uh, we're going to have a choice of either picking a weeded bourbon or a wheat whiskey. Uh, so, guys, tune in tomorrow if you're interested in checking that out. Uh, it's going to be again at 9 o'clock tomorrow night. Uh, Greg will be on again, again with Dan and Julie like, and also uh, Todd Ritter along with me and Scott. Um, and, you know, Greg will be able to kind of talk us through these, uh, these weeded bourbons and, and kind of the flavor profiles here. But um, the thing that struck me about the weeded, the weeded bourbon is it's extremely perfumey on the nose, but also very, very sweet. There's a lot of sweetness coming through. Now, this isn't a bad thing at all. But I smell like growing up, my grandma used to buy me all the bad cereals, all the bad ones. <laughs> I mean, we're talking Frosted Flakes, Fruity Pebbles, Cocoa Puffs, all the bad cereals. And um, this actually reminds me a little bit of like a bowl of Fruity Pebbles. Oh, but I mean, it comes off like that fruity and that sweet. It's mm -hmm. a little floral. It's a little perfumey. This one is... Now, this is a little bit of a higher proof, correct? We're looking at about 92, right? That one, yeah, weighted bourbon is uh, offered at 92 proof, and the wheat whiskey is offered at 100. Yeah, and when I've had some of the single barrels, it was like that fruity pebbles and that boldness was just like amped up to the 10th notch here, which was great. I, I'm a huge fan of the, of the weeded bourbon. Now, the wheat whiskey you have is actually kind of a – a call back to your rye, which is a 95.5 rye, but your, exactly. weeded whiskey, your weeded whiskey is a 95.5 weeder. Correct? Yes, yep, sure right. is. And uh, again, that was, uh, that was really uh, leveraging uh, my experience and everything that we learned uh, relative to making that 95% rye mash yep. bill. Uh, the 95 rye mash bill is extremely hard to produce and have the quality come out right. Uh, rye has... Uh, uh, components in the grain that corn doesn't, that just makes it uh, a very difficult mash to handle and a very difficult yeah. mash uh, to ferment. And uh, just so happens that wheat shares a lot of those same problems. Uh, foaming is a, is a major problem. Uh, viscosity of the mash is a problem. Yep. And, and a lot of the enzymes and uh, techniques that we used uh, to uh, uh to work around some of those uh, issues, uh, all, all directly translated to the 95% wheat whiskey. So, uh, you know, again, uh, uh, an extreme, an extreme wheat whiskey mash bill. Uh, most other wheat weeded uh, whiskeys on the market are probably in the neighborhood of 51% wheat, and may even have a third cereal grain in it. Uh, so, again, we we took this mash bill uh, to the max uh, to be different and. Uh, Again, everything that uh, that I'd learned, uh, uh, you know, from the secret folks on how to produce those products and and, and have it come out as a world class quality whiskey uh, is, you know, really all I can do. I can't guarantee you'll like the mash bills, but yeah, any anything with Old Elk's name on it, I can tell you uh, firsthand because I produced it. It it is absolutely from a quality perspective. Uh, world-class stuff. Yeah, and I will say anything I've ever had from Old Elk um, <clears throat> has been extremely unique, which I always look for, especially in today's market where there's bourbons are a dime a dozen and whiskeys. Um, and then you have, you know, when you have unique mash bills like this, it definitely, I, I didn't realize the mash bills when Old Elk first hit the shelf. I did not realize, like I knew who you were and I saw your name on the bottle. I'm like, okay, this has to be good. When I took a deeper dive and found out what those mash bills were, I'm like, all right, Greg is doing something really unique here. As this stuff gets older, I think it's going to be absolutely fantastic. It's already good now. Mm -hmm. Like, my God, when this stuff gets a few more years on it, it's going to be insane. Um, I mean, quickly, quickly, I want to raise my glass to a couple people in the chat. So one, uh, B Sims, who's in the chat, it's his birthday tomorrow. So I just want to uh, he's a big supporter of the Mass Syndrome. He's always in the chat. I want to raise a glass uh, to B Sims. It's happy birthday, B. Happy birthday. Uh, and to another excuse to drink. That's <laughs> that's right. And uh, and another another really good one here is uh, Patrick Fulmer. Uh, cheers to my ex-wife. After months of treatment for breast cancer, she got a clean, 
bill of health mm. day on her birthday. Now, if that's not something to be celebrated, I don't know what it, what is. So uh, cheers, Patrick Palmer. That's great. Exactly. Man. Absolutely. Congratulations on that. That's right. So Greg, man, I see you drinking. I see you drinking, but everything I read, everything I listened to, you were not a whiskey drinker in the beginning, were you? <laughs> uh, well, no, and uh, probably as a general rule, I'm still not. Uh, I, I I know good whiskey. I enjoy good whiskey, but uh, uh, my real drink of choice is Coors Light. <laughs> <laughs> I have to mess up. The, everybody, just so you know, make that note down. The, <laughs> one of the world's greatest master distillers is drinking Coors Light every night. <laughs> is that I, let's let's not lie, man? That's what actually brought you to Colorado, didn't it? <laughs> uh, a few bricks in that building down here in Golden. <laughs> um. So so you have you have two other mash bills. You also have uh, well, we talked about the wheat whiskey. Let's mm -hmm. talk about the rye. Um. Uh, the rye is actually, I couldn't find it locally, but uh, what, tell me about the rye whiskey, the mash bill and that. And I also really want to kind of pick your brain here, uh, a couple of a few myths about rye whiskey. But first, tell us a little bit about the uh, the rye whiskey, uh, the mash bill and, and what you got going on with that. Yeah. So uh, that mash bill is uh, the same 95% rye, 5% malt that, that we made famous in Lawrenceburg. Uh, just, just so happens that uh, because it's so difficult to produce, uh, it's, it's, it's one of my favorites, uh, from a technical aspect. So, uh, uh, it's, it is a little hard to find. It's, it's somewhat of an allocated product. We don't have a, a, a huge amount of inventory, but, yeah. uh, again, it's, it's, uh, it's a, a really nice product and it's probably one of my favorites to produce because it's a technical challenge. Yeah. Uh, so, all right. So, so the old elk rye is a is a nice throwback, a ninety five five rye. Um, so, so there there's there's a few things that about rye whiskey that come out that I know is so that a lot of people say and that I've heard in the industry is rye whiskey more expensive to craft than a bourbon overall. Oh yeah, sure. Okay, is, does rye whiskey do better at two to three years than a bourbon does? Uh, I would say no. no, no. Okay, so that's so that's kind of a debunked myth because I feel like people there there I've seen a lot more distillers release a young rye whiskey over a rye over a uh, over a young bourbon because the myth has always been bourbon uh, rye whiskey does better at younger ages. What's what uh what what about that myth is you know can you talk to? Well, I guess like a lot probably depends on the amount of rye in the mash bill. Okay. Uh, again, I, I most everything uh, from my perspective, it's all, all the 95 rye mash bills is my experience and, and my, uh, uh, you know, that's what I'm familiar with. But, uh, I, I, I don't, you know, if, if you can, if you can wait, I think any whiskey deserves to be uh, four years old. Yeah, uh, at the least. I, I um, totally agree. I totally agree. Uh, I mean, I I realize that, you know, there's young distilleries that have to get out there and get product out and start making some revenue. And I get that. But at the same time, you know, if, if you put out a young whiskey that, you know, is not the greatest, that might kind of hurt the reputation before your good stuff starts coming out, you know? Yeah, that's very true. And yeah. what, what I actually found with the weeded bourbon and the wheat and the, the high wheat bourbon and the high wheat whiskey wheat whiskey is that they actually needed uh five and six years old before they were ready uh, they don't have any of the robust characteristics that corn brings to the table mm -hmm. and, and it took more uh took more of the uh barrel and, and more of the maturity notes to really carry it uh so I, I looked at both those products at four years old we were wanting to launch them at four and they just weren't ready uh the weeded bourbon was ready at five, but the wheat whiskey wasn't really ready till it was six years old. And those, those two products will actually improve with age over the next three to four or five years. Yeah. So, so, I mean, we're looking at good ages on your product now. I think, mm -hmm. I think some people that maybe do not know old elk or they think they know old elk <laughs> that it's younger whiskey, 
but your most of your products now, maybe except the rye, are around six years old, correct? Yeah, we're we're in the five to six year old range for uh, you know uh, a bulk of our inventory. So, hey guys, just so you know, that's the same age as Blanton's. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I always have to. I always have to dig Blanton's a little bit. <laughs> um, so, is there what what kind of facility is there in Colorado? Do you have a distillery? How's it coming along? I know Sham in the chat uh, had asked about that. What's what what do we have working out in Colorado? Is there a distillery, a gift shop? What what do we got out there? Well, we have we have a a small craft distillery. Okay. Uh, and, and we have a, uh, a tasting room out there called uh, the Reserve of Old Elk. And it is, it's a, uh, that is a world-class tasting room. It's right in historic uh, downtown Fort Collins. Nice. Uh, and and uh, all the products that we have in inventory can be uh, tasted at the tasting room, even if they're not, haven't come to market yet. So, uh, you know, we have been working on, on uh, designing and uh, hope to build a full-scale distillery. Uh, in the future to support, uh, you know, all of Old Elk's needs going forward. But uh, really the the business plan all along was to build the brand first and build the distillery later. So, uh, yeah. So that, that's kind of the, uh, um, the roadmap uh, and business plan uh, that we're working off of right now. Um, so RVA Whiskey says picked up two weeded. We did bourbon five-year Virginia barrel select bottles at 113.7 proof. Complete hitters. They didn't last very long. <laughs> uh, so so uh, I was actually corrected. We are actually picking two of these tomorrow. We're actually going to get to pick one of the weeded whiskeys and one of the weeded bourbons for uh, the Mass and Journey Whiskey Club. So, um, yeah, we're going to be picking two barrels tomorrow, guys. So I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited now. <laughs> um, so... As far as so, your knowledge of of whiskey and mash bills and distillation, um, as much as you can, what's a little bit of the future look like for Old Elk? Are we are we continuing to, uh, I, I guess, you know, evolve the whiskeys you have now? Do you have other mash bills in mind or other uh, finishes that that you might be looking to do? I mean, what what do you have in the pipeline that you can maybe talk about a little bit? Well, we actually, uh, in, in the next few months, we'll be coming out with uh, uh, four categories of uh, secondary finish. I think we have uh, a sherry, a port, uh, Armagnac, and a uh, cognac, I believe. I'm sorry, uh, did you did you say Armagnac? Yes, sir. Oh, my God. <laughs> so those those barrels are uh, are really ready to harvest as we speak. So those those products should be hitting the market. So which uh, which which product are you finishing in those four barrels? Is this your weeded bourbon or your blended bourbon? Uh, this go around, it's the blended bourbon. Old okay, blended nice. bourbon. Uh, and then uh, later in the year, there'll be a, a master distiller blend that I've put together that'll be coming out. Uh, it'll it'll be uh, I'm going to say it's going to be better than Metsa Select if you've had Metsa Select. So uh, look, looking forward to putting that one out there. Yeah, see, already, Armagnac, where do I sign up? Uh, Steve A, Sherry Port, Armagnac, and Coyote, we're doomed. <laughs> yes, we are doomed. So, yeah, um, we're looking, and uh, actually, another product that uh, is, is just hitting the market is a, a, a sour mash reserve. So, it's actually, okay, uh, it's actually the old elk uh, blended bourbon mash bill that, that I crafted, uh, but, uh, that old elk actually took that that same mash bill to two other distilleries, uh, uh, even after I produced a sizable amount in Lawrence in Lawrenceburg. But so they had uh, they took that mash bill to a uh, a craft distillery in uh, Colorado and and laid down some barrels, and they took the same mash bill to uh, a New York distillery and laid down some barrels. So uh, uh, different different climates, uh, different flora fauna. Uh, yeah, absolutely. different, different uh, climate, different geography. Uh, all that impacts, uh, all that impacts the congener profile. So it, it's kind of an interesting uh, experiment for the consumer. They can, they can see uh, what different uh, geography does to the same mash bill. So 
No, I there. mean you're I mean you're only talking about just so you're taking so stuff that you lay down, you're you're laying this down in in different so it's aging in different states. Yes. But are you getting the grain from the same place? Nope. Uh, so uh, Oh, okay, interesting. Uh, it, uh, the only thing the only thing that's the same is the mash bill. So the the yeast is different. The uh, uh, all of our products are are really sour mash, but the uh, the distillery in in uh, New York had a different approach to souring than what I used. So uh, that's that's a variable that uh, makes <laughs> makes the two products different. Uh, and it, it's it's really it's fun because you you can take really the same mash bill and, and see what changes are imparted by all the other variables that uh, result from where it's made and how it's made. Yeah, that's fascinating. That's something I've talked about uh, across American whiskey. A lot of people say that, you know, all bourbon kind of tastes the same. <laughs> I don't say a lot of people. There are some people that believe that. But um, in, in the time of American whiskey that we have now, with the amount of craft distilleries and different distilleries sourcing different grains from different areas across the country, um, the flora fauna, the uh, the geography, where it ages, the air, the climate, the temperature definitely plays a part in all of how these uh, taste and, um, and and how they come out. Absolutely. Uh, and you could definitely probably taste this in these these uh, sour mass reserves. That's really crazy. Um. Going to have to make room for an old elk shelf by end of the year with all the goodies coming out. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is very very true. Um, uh, yes, very five dollars super chat. You receive one entry for the giveaway, one of two bottles of old elk. Going to be giving away two bottles tonight, guys. So um, uh, let's see here. Any other questions for you? Um, Shem Ashley ask uh, ask Greg about the books he has written by the scientists at Seagrams. Is there anything in there he's looking to try? Would it be these two books? <laughs> <laughs> he's got them right there. <laughs> uh, they're called the Blue Bibles, and uh, yeah, these these were these are company Seagram textbooks, and it's uh, the culmination of uh, forty plus years of research and development. Holy and, cow. and there's just a wealth of knowledge. Of one one book is pretty much strictly distillation. Mm -hmm. And the other book is pretty much uh, production and fermentation. But uh, there's, again, there's uh, from the 1940s to the late 1980s, uh, this is uh, a collection of everything that, that uh, led to world-class whiskey. So this, these are literally, uh, they've always been termed uh, by the Seagram, anybody that, that used them or anybody that came up through Seagram's are, have always been known as the blue Bibles. Is that, is that mandatory reading at Seagram's? <laughs> uh, not mandatory, but you'd be foolish not to. Uh, <laughs> just, uh, I mean, that's, you, there's just, that knowledge is nowhere else. Uh, it's, it's nowhere else. Um, so <clears throat> I want to ask you about uh, you and Kate Douglas um, developed the old Elks proprietary the slow cut proofing process mm -hmm. where the liquid is proofed down over a period of weeks instead of that traditional 24 to 48 hours. Um, can you, can you speak a little to what that process is and why it makes your whiskey so different? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, again, we didn't, we didn't invent that process, it, uh, but we uh, surely adopted it and we, okay. I mean, we adopted it, uh, you know, in our own way, but uh, I don't want to take credit for uh, inventing the process because we didn't. But uh, uh, the way it works is when you when you proof uh, from barrel proof to bottling proof, uh, it's literally a uh, an ex exothermic reaction. It liberates heat in into your product. Okay. And if if you if you cut in one one big step or two big steps, you're releasing all that heat into your product essentially all at once and that that heat can actually be enough to actually drive away some of the really delicate uh, uh, high volatile congeners that you work so hard to produce so the way we uh, help to preserve those is rather than doing it in one or two big steps we do it in uh, several 
in many steps, essentially over a longer period of time so that uh, in any given step, we're putting an incrementally small amount of heat back into the product. Uh, we use the same amount of water from start to finish that everybody uses, but by doing it in small steps and over a longer period of time, and you're not putting all the heat in at once. So it, it actually just helps preserve uh, some of the really delicate high volatile uh, congeners like aldehydes and, and ethyl acetates and so, so forth. So, I mean, in my research that I've done, is that similar to the to the, uh, to the the process they use in French distillation with brandies and cognacs when they're adding water over time, or is that a different process? Well, I'm not familiar with that process uh, so much, unfortunately. I'm, I probably need to look into that myself, but uh, uh, I wouldn't doubt that, that uh, some of that reasoning applies. Yeah, it, it's it's not so much uh, adding water, you know, before it goes into the bottle. It's kind of adding water as it goes along distillation, which is something I was mm -hmm. able to talk to Nancy Fraley about a little bit. She's implemented yeah. she's implemented those techniques at some distilleries uh, across the country that she's helped with. So I was wondering if it was kind of a similar process. Uh, could well be actually. You know, Nancy's uh, where Kate got the idea for the slow proof. Oh, so uh, maybe it is the same. Yeah. Okay, yeah, interesting. Uh, and yeah. I, again, we we didn't invent it, but we adopted our own method. Uh, yeah, it'll it'll help to, to utilize it. Oh, cheers, Adam! I appreciate that. Yeah, I love uh, love giving you guys all the information I can here, especially from Greg Metz, absolutely le uh, great living legend. And, and uh, Matt, uh, Greg's last name is actually uh, it's spelled differently, but it's basically my favorite baseball team, the New York Mets. <laughs> 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 Just saying, uh, whiskey, whiskey mountains. Yes. Science and whiskey, my favorite combo. Thanks, Greg. Yes. Uh, um, whiskey mountains is probably totally Adriana who, uh, actually is out in, in Utah. She does these great reviews in the mountains, literally in the mountains. And, uh, she's got a, uh, science background and I'm sure she's geeking out over this stuff. Oh, fun. Um, Adam Shelton go. Uh, there you go. Yeah, if, if he meant to say Braves, I, I'm, I'm actually glad that he spelled it wrong because, uh, yeah, go Mets, buddy. <laughs> um, so what, what, uh, what's, your, what's your entry proof into the barrel for Old Elk? Uh, berries. Uh, the uh, Old Elk uh, blended bourbon goes in at 115, and uh, the, the other mash bills go in at 120. Man, this uh, this weeder, I keep going back to this weeded bourbon. It is so damn good. It just keeps evolving. You you said like chocolate. I'm getting a, that little bit of a chocolate hit on here as well, which is delicious. Um, and it's not something you would normally get from, you know, I don't get a lot of chocolate from a lot of weeders, but this one, I'm definitely getting it a little mm -hmm. bit. It's, it's nice. And does, does that have to do with the type of wheat you're getting from, you think? Uh, we used uh, soft uh, red winter wheat. Uh, that's that's one of the uh, – that's really from a uh, mashing and distilling standpoint is, is yeah, a pre yeah. preferred uh, uh, type. Um, all right. So I'm going to give you a couple of quick questions before I let you go. Everybody on the that's watching, please hang out. Uh, we'll let we'll let Greg Metz get back to uh, what he's got to do tonight and get some rest. Uh, we could stay on and hang out and talk a little bit about oh, the. We have another big tonight. night tomorrow. Yeah, we're gonna have another fun night tomorrow, man. So Absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. But uh, um, so real quick, Greg. So if you're, we know you like Coors Light. <laughs> when you're uh, when you're hanging out, if you're, are you are you a cocktail guy? What's kind of your favorite go to cocktail? I really don't do cocktails so much. I, if, you know, I, I uh, enjoy bourbon and whiskeys uh, uh, straight. Uh, I do like a little ice in mine rather than uh, neat. But, uh, you know, one of the big reasons that I, uh, you know, on a daily basis go to beer is because I just don't metabolize whiskey very well. So, if, oh, if, okay. Yeah, that makes if, sense. Uh, yeah. So yeah. If, I, if I have a, Two or three whiskeys, I'm good. But after the third one, it's it's a, a uncontrollable fall, and you can't tell when it's coming. So, <laughs> 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 so it's it's self preservation really more than anything. Um, you uh, 
I, I might, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna show you something here that might be a little embarrassing, but you, uh -oh. just, you just talked about a fall. Yeah. So I did a blind tasting a while back of a bunch of Elijah Craig barrel proof uh, bottles. And these were all in the 130s, 120s. Oh boy. And I'm gonna show, this is what happened to me when the camera, after I was done with the, with the, with the review, I was ready to get off camera and then this happened. Ah, uh, I fell. <laughs> uh, that's cute. So, <laughs> so I, I would imagine that's what happens to you when you have too much whiskey. <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, I can't ever tell when that point's coming. It just happens. <laughs> Oh my God. Yeah. I fell down yeah, pretty much <laughs> the fall. Um, uh, what's your, if, if you had to pick a favorite music genre that you're into, what do you like listening to? Do you, do you like listening to music while you're distilling or you kind of like a quiet? Are you kind of in a Zen, a Zen distiller? Oh no, it's uh, a good mix of all of that on any given day. I, um, you know, grew up, uh, on hard rock in the eighties. So that's probably, uh, any mix of that is, is probably going to happen on any given day. So, yeah, I don't, um, I'm more of a, I guess I'm more of a song person than I am a band person. So it's. Uh, oh, nice. Okay. Uh, Brian Hunter has a good question. Do you have any special releases? If I come to the distillery, do you have distillery only releases at all? Uh, they have, uh, if, if they go to the tasting room, I think they have, uh, uh, they, they've, at the craft distillery that we have in Fort Collins, uh, they've crafted a lot of other uh, unique and custom mash bills. So I think I think uh, some of those are available at the tasting room. Uh, they're not available uh, retail, but uh, you can certainly taste them at the tasting room. Um, all right, guys. So we'll have a few more questions uh, for Greg um, before we let him go. And uh, he gets ready for our uh, barrel pick tomorrow night, which will be a lot of fun. No doubt. Um, actually, Greg, what, just going through the what do what do you think we should drink first tomorrow? The the wheat whiskeys or the wheated bourbons? Well, uh, my training uh, says that you go from the lightest uh, congen or profile to the heaviest, so I, I would recommend going the wheat whiskey first. Nice. Okay. And then do and then do the wheated bourbon. Um, let's see. Um, all right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got some other questions in here. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Let's see here if there's any other questions. Um, um, yeah, everyone's still laughing at me falling on my ass. It's always good. <laughs> uh, it's always good when you can laugh at yourself. Yeah, exactly. Um, hey, Abby, uh, Abby who inks. Hey there, Jason. Big fan of videos. First time I've ever had the chance to catch you live. You're awesome. Thank you so much, Abby. Uh, Abby who inks. I'm, I'm guessing you're a tattoo artist, Abby, which is awesome. Um, hey, Will Henderson is here. What's up, Hendo? Um, so here's a good question. Zachary Heron says, what tends to be your favorite note in a whiskey? Something that really pulls you in. That's a really good question. So when you're when you're tasting and what are you what are you looking for personally? Well, I, I'm uh, really uh very much the traditionalist. So I, I, I like, uh, I like the vanilla, I like the caramel and, uh, I really like oak notes. Uh, obviously if it's dry, I like that clove spice characteristic that I talked about oh, yeah. er earlier in the show. So yeah, which, which uh, is a big, which is a big component of some of those 95 fives. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. um, very cool. Um, all right. I guess with that, um, Greg, I want to thank you for coming on tonight and having a nice chat with us. I I learned a lot from you. I don't know if everybody else in the chat did. This was a really uh, fascinating conversation. Um, I cannot wait for you to uh, be on tomorrow night as we we pick the weeders uh, for uh, the Mass and Journey Whiskey Room uh, and for the Mass and Journey Whiskey Club. Uh, really, really uh, looking forward to that. Uh, everybody in the chat, hang out. I'm not going offline just yet. Uh, I'm going to hang out for a little bit longer. I want to tell you some more about some stuff that happened last week when we did the picks. So everyone hang in there. I just want to thank Greg. We'll let him go, and we'll see you again tomorrow night, Greg. Thank you so much for your time.
and, and your knowledge and just your uh, your legendary distilling prowess. I really appreciate it. Well, I appreciate you having me on, and I look forward to meeting you again tomorrow. So, yeah. All right. All Cheers, right. Greg. Thanks Cheers. a lot, buddy. Yeah, appreciate it. Salute. Take care. All right, guys. Well, there it was. Greg Metz, the legend. Let me uh, get rid of this branding here. Uh, wow. I'm uh, I'm pretty blown away by that that uh, all that information that I just soaked in my head right there. <laughs> that was that was freaking awesome. Oh, uh, Greg is the man. Um, yeah, literally a legend in his own right, guys. I mean, all that stuff. I mean, I'm literally looking at my shelves today before he came on and thinking. God, how much of this shit do I own that did he freaking distill? Uh, did he lay down? Did he lay down, you know, those barrels? Oh, my God. I I kind of came up with a number. I'm like, I have to have at least 65 to 70 to 80 different bottles that that dude distilled. So um, an incredible guest. Again, he's going to be on tomorrow night right here at 9 o'clock uh, to pick some of these great old elk barrels. We're picking a weeded bourbon and a wheat whiskey, which is going to be a lot of fun. So, um I did want to talk to you guys. I'm going to I'm going to pour something else here. Um what should I pour? Um guys, get break out some more bourbons here. We got some more whiskeys. We are not done yet. We're going to be hanging out a little bit long. Yeah, master class for sure. Uh heck yeah, Jason. I'm a high school art teacher by day, tattoo artist by night and weekends. Oh, that's awesome, Abby. Um Justin Jonas says Jason just want to commend your interviewing skills. You always do a great job with these. I appreciate that, man. I do a lot of research <clears throat> before I uh, before I do an interview because I want to make sure I'm asking the right questions and bringing you guys the stuff that you want to hear. Great content, Jason. Thank you so much. Golf whiskey, great interview, great info. Epic whiskey tuber. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I am 80 minutes into a total geek out. Yeah, I learned a lot, guys. I think the whole thing about the uh, the starch content and some of those grains and how he built those mash bills was fascinating. I mean, that was, I mean, that was like the point where I was like, like, what, what the hell is he saying? That's crazy. Uh, get an old card in your glass. Okay. I'll get an old card in my glass. All right, Shem. I see you, Shem. We'll do that. Um, I am going to open, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to open batch nine, which is one of the new ones. I haven't, uh, I haven't tried this since I tasted it in the old Carter tasting room. Uh, but I do want to tell you guys a little bit about the uh, the Elijah Craig Barrel Proof pick that me and Scott did. And we also were joined by a couple of other people that you might know. <laughs> uh, so Bobby from I Whiskey She Wines joined us on that pick. He joined us for the, uh, for the Elijah Craig Barrel Proof pick, which was a lot of fun. And also uh, Dustin, um, or you might know him as D.H. Silve or Top Shelf Dustin in the chat. He also helped with the pick. And honestly, guys, we literally could have been in there for fucking 10 minutes, like 10 minutes of uh, of picking because we got three barrels to choose from from Heaven Hill. And honestly, the first two barrels were extremely subpar. And we were not feeling it or digging them at all. We're like, man, if this third barrel isn't good, like what happens? Are, are we walking away from this? Are we... Are we asking for more samples down the line? Um, are they going to pull more barrels out? Because they look like they were not in – oh, yeah. They look like they were not in any mood or any position to pull out more barrels for us or more samples. So, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, beautiful elixir of Old Carter. So this is the Old Carter Batch 9 bourbon, guys. Let me put that up there for you to take a, to take a look at it. Uh, coming at 116.8 proof, uh, beautiful goodness. This was, uh, they signed it for me here. Uh, uh, there you go. Sherry and Mark Carter and their Sherry signature, which is a little bit more fancy on top. <laughs> so, uh, oh my God. Oh, there it is. The butterscotchy, almost that little bit of a coffee note. I'm going to let that open up a little bit. Uh, let's see here. Abby, Jason, your research info, totally crazy. You have made my whiskey schooling really fun. Oh, I'm, that's, I really appreciate that, Abby. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for dropping that link in Cheech. We're going to be doing that tomorrow night. Hopefully you guys can uh, take a peek in and watch that. That'll be a lot of fun. 
Uh, let's see. What is that Balcones that you have some that the, the back there, bro? Oh, this is the, um, I have the Balcones lineage, which is a newer release. Um, so that's a really good one. And I also have the, the Balcones Maltzilla, which is a French Oak beast. I mean, that's a great sticker on it. The Maltzilla fury and French Oak. <laughs> So that's what that is. Um, this French oak one, the Maltzilla, is one of the most incredible Texas whiskeys I've ever had. It's that good. Um, so yeah, so so Scott and myself and Bobby and, and Dustin, we're sitting there hanging out and we're we're trying these uh, these barrels from Heaven Hill. We try the first two and duds, and then the third barrel that comes up is uh, we're like, oh my god, thank God that this is really good. So the third barrel that we picked was actually the youngest of the three. So now remember me telling you guys we didn't know, you know, what those, what the ages of these barrels were going to be. We had a nine, 10, and an eight-year barrel, uh, barrels to choose from. The nine-year up front was probably one of the, like, you could have mistaken in it for a Jim Beam product. It was that, like, peanut forward, which you do get with Heaven Hill sometimes. Um, the middle barrel which was the 10 year, the oldest one was the very, very far out there outlier. It was very strange. It was very off profile, heaven Hill, uh, very extremely floral and perfumey. Nothing I had really had from heaven Hill ever before. Uh, not what we were, we were looking for, um, especially for you guys. And then we were just like, um, what the, you know, what, what's happening? Hey, Burben's in the house. He's hanging out in South Virginia. Uh, love the interview with Greg. Have a number of barrel picks that my uh, local liquor store has. Oh, awesome, Danny. Uh, America, pop him, don't watch him is here. What is up, Troy? Uh, yeah, batch nine is dark, savory cola, popcorn, cracker jack, sea salt, dark chalk, dark chocolate. There you go. Yeah, for sure. Um, when I tried all these in a row, I think batch nine ended up being my favorite. Oh my God. Yeah. All the, all the things I get in a little bit of like a coffee bean note in this one. This is probably the closest one to batch five that I've, that I've uh, smelled. You guys know, I love my, my batch five. Oh God. That's so good. Oh, the Carters are brilliant. <laughs> so, uh, wow. That's good. Um, Oh, it's finished, still going. Sorry, I'm kind of waxing poetic on this bottle right now. Um, so, so yeah, so the third barrel was everything we were looking for. The really nice punch of proof, beautiful caramel, buttery. Uh, it was it was caramel, vanilla heavy, and then it had this beautiful milk chocolate finish on that barrel. So, our bottle that we selected, our barrel ended up being an eight year old. It was the youngest one, but it was also the darkest. When we pulled it, when we thieved this right out of the barrel, this thing was easily the darkest uh, out, of, out of all three, and which was interesting because it was the youngest. So that made us ask, okay, so where the hell was this aged? It ended up being in the highest rick of the three, uh, which means it probably got a lot more heat, which got a lot more color, and got a lot more flavor. So uh, I think we lucked out with that one, and we were really happy. Uh, the next uh, The next day in the morning, Scott and I took a, a trip down south over to Danville, Kentucky to finally see the Wilderness Trail operation, which uh, let me tell you guys, you know, I, I've had the, I've been blessed with the opportunity to have a lot of great barrel picks, um, but hey, SG Flying High, what's up, man? Uh, Mass and Drone, I'll definitely have to rewatch the stream. Looks like it was a hitter. You always have great guests. Thank you so much, Joe. Yep. Uh, next week, we're going to actually have uh, ASW on the channel, ASW Distilling out of Georgia. Uh, they are making some really, really unique whiskey, so they're going to be on uh, as well next week. So uh, mark that on your calendar as well. Um, so, so Scott and I, we get, to, uh, we get to Wilderness Trail, and the Brewbaker maker, Ernie, who's in the chat, and his daughter, Dr. Caitlin Brewbaker, were hanging out waiting for us. We got to do some incredible barrel picks. Now, like I said, I've been blessed to do a lot of great barrel picks on uh, the last year or so. This one was probably my favorite experience, not only because the brew bakers were there and because it was just a really fun time, but uh, 
it's old school, man. It's old school. A lot of times when you go into these distilleries and you and you do a barrel pick, everything's laid out for you. You know, they have samples already poured. Sometimes they're already proofed down to what the bottle proof is going to be. Sometimes uh, it's like a big grand tasting room. And that is all well and good. I am not complaining. That's, it, you know, it's a beautiful experience. Need another sip of this. Oh, my God. Not so good. Um, but the best part of this is... Uh, cheers. I'm here and I'm in. Shari G. <laughs> What's up, Shari G? Uh, Scott Moody says, Going to the Gulf Coast area this weekend. Anyone know of a good whiskey you can only get in that area? Uh, help them out if anyone's in the Gulf Coast. Um, so we were, uh, we get to Wilderness Trail. I mean, it's old school. So our barrel manager was Macaulay. So Macaulay, who goes by the Bourbon Swami, <laughs> he uh, he starts taking us around. Uh, he basically shows up with a fucking drill. He's got a drill in his hand. He's got a box of a box of Glen Cairns, and he's got a speaker to play music on. So uh, he we we walk in the Wilderness Trail Warehouse. Now, mind you, we're picking a single barrel rye. So we walk in. We don't know really what to expect. It smells amazing. We walk up the stairs. We get to the uh, to the upper floors of the warehouse. And um, he starts playing some music, and the dude just takes a drill and starts drilling into barrels, old school style. Um, I think that's that's something with barrel picks that isn't done a lot of anymore. And I really, really appreciated that about Wilderness Trail. Not only for that, but for also, um, uh, you know, Ernie and Caitlin getting that experience as well. I've only done one other pick where we got to drill into barrels. And it wasn't nearly as many as we did here at Wilderness Trail. We got to drill into six barrels total. Um, yeah, good thing it wasn't a chainsaw. Exactly. Uh, and what's uh, what, what's really cool is we went through different parts of the warehouse. He's like, let's uh, – oh, Bubble Bat Bourbon's here. He says, day late, dollar short. Old Elk is legit. Love the wheat whiskey. Absolutely, man. We're, uh, we're picking uh, two – we're picking a wheat whiskey and a weeded bourbon for the Mash and Journey Whiskey Club tomorrow, so we're really excited for that. Ernie, yeah, it was an amazing day. Look, he has a he has a, a shot of uh, Wilderness Trail in his profile picture. Um, we he's drilling different barrels. The first couple barrels were really spicy rise, very minty, very spearmint. Um, it wasn't really the balance we were looking for. Then he goes into another part of the warehouse. He's drilling some more barrels. Uh, uh, Ernie and, and Caitlin both got to drill some barrels as well, which was a lot of fun for them. Uh, then we got to taste some of those. And then we got to barrel number five, the fifth barrel he drilled into. And I could tell you a, a consensus. We were all like, what the hell is this? This is ridiculous. Um, and you know how I know why it's, it's, it was that good. It's because, it's going to sound crazy, and this happened. You can ask Ernie and Caitlin in the chat. This actually happened. Oh, Caitlin said, my ears are burning. Looks like I'm late to the party. Yeah, Caitlin, I'm just talking about our experience at Wilderness Trail a little bit. So this this actual, this actual shit actually happened. It's a, It was a sign. It was a sign from the rock and roll gods. Uh, he drills barrel five. We pour it. We're tasting it. I literally pick up the glass. I mean, we're nosing it to death because it smelled amazing. And um, Northern Colorado represented. That's right, Mike Stahl. Everyone go check out Live Wire Whiskey as well. Really great channel. I think they're going live after me. I'm not sure if you guys are. Let me know. Um, we're nosing this thing. We're like, Jesus, this smells good. I mean, incredible, sweet, minty, rich, like extremely, extremely rich on the nose. I mean, the flavors, it smelled like a Kentucky owl. We were saying like how rich and how robust the nose was. I took a sip, literally, I went like this, and Ernie and, and Kaylin in the chat backed me up. I took a sip. And then on the radio, the music starts playing. A modern day warrior, mean, mean child. Today's Tom Sawyer, mean, mean cry. <laughs> Rush comes on, Tom Sawyer. As soon as I took the sip, no joke. It was a sign, and we tasted this stuff. 
and Rush is playing in the background. And I was like, this this is the pick. This is the pick. It's got to be. There's no way it's going to be get any better than what just happened. Holy shit! Tom Sawyer starts playing on the on the on the radios. We're taking sips of this barrel number five. Oh my god, it was epic. Um, so just to make sure, Macaulay was like, you know what? Let's drill one more barrel from this area, and we'll do a blind tasting. So we drill a barrel six. Uh, we start tasting that. We take it back to the office. We uh, we we. So Macaulay sets it up. So we do a blind tasting between the two. An X, uh, he drew an X and a triangle on uh, each of the glasses. Um, and uh, X was the barrel number five that we picked that was uh, playing when, uh, that we chose when, that we tasted when Tom Sawyer started blaring on the freaking radio. And it was, it was unanimous. I mean, Macaulay picked barrel five. Me and Scott did. Ernie and Caitlin did. It was ridiculous. Yeah, I mean... Whiskey Mountains, Jason lived his very own beautiful epic moment montage. Yeah, I wish it was like, I wish it happened in like slow motion somehow. Like it's it, like it happened in slow motion. It was ridiculous. Um, yeah, Ru yeah, Rush came on. Yeah, Brew Baker Maker. Yeah, Rush came on. It, it, we were all, it was crazy. So yeah, and Jason Coates, this is going to be the name of the pick. It's going to be called Tom Sawyer's Mean Mean Rye. So that's going to be the name of that pick. Um, holy crap. It's, it's so freaking good. Uh, Dennis Boyle says new to the bourbon world. Love the content. What happens after, uh, what happens after the pick? Yeah. So yeah, the ex Glenn came home with me. Yeah. Ernie, we got to take that home, but did you have the slow clap? Uh, we did kind of at the end, we kind of did a nice slow cheers, took a picture of it. It was great. Yeah. That, that day was amazing. Caitlin, uh, and I don't know if she had done that yet, but for the first time when we were signing the barrel, we all got to sign our barrel and Caitlin, uh, she signed it, you know, Caitlin, you know, farm D cause she's now a pharmacist. Uh, and then Macaulay, the barrel manager, he's like, dude, he's like, put doctor in front of your name. So she went back, wrote doctor, signed it. And, uh, we were signed, still deliver. That was our barrel. And it was effing amazing. Uh, it was such a, such a great, such a great, uh, such a great time. It was a great day. Um, uh, uh, let's see here. Not mine. We hatched it. Yeah, we have to, we, yeah, we hatched that, that name in the Patreon chat last night. It's going to be Tom Sawyer's Me, Mean, Mean Rye. It's going to be kind of a rush theme. I'm definitely going to have, uh, the, uh, the Brew Baker's name in there somehow on that sticker. It's going to be a lot of, it's going to be a lot of fun. So yeah, old man Joe, I need that bottle. Yeah, it's going to be sick. It's going to be. You guys know I'm a Rush fan, so I'm going to do justice to that sticker. So, Abby Who Inks, the pick will be available. Uh, they said it's only about eight weeks. So, uh, I think we'll we'll have it pretty soon. We're really excited for that one. Only about two months out for that pick. And I'm going to buy so many of that pick because it's so damn effing good. If you guys like rye whiskey, holy shit, you will absolutely love this. Uh, this is better than... Um, I mean, God, this is better than a lot of ryes that I've had, especially lately. This thing is an absolute beast of a rye. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, the bourbon wrench is still here. The mash and drum. Uh, have the kit on the raft of that sticker. Have the kit on the raft on that. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think that'll definitely be on there, man. Oh, Whiskey Nose is going live after uh, the mash and drum tonight. So Whiskey Nose, everyone can tune into that. And it sounded like an awesome, epic time. It really was. Uh, <laughs> Caitlin Brubaker, how are you not putting doctor in front of everything? I'm not over getting to do that six months later. <laughs> so that's the thing, Nick. We don't know the proof of it. We were trying to guess because we were drilling right into barrels. That's the other thing. When you do some of these picks, they usually will tell you the proof. They'll have the age ready for you. We were told that the age around these for these ryes were between four and five years old. And with what Dr. Uh, Patrick Heiss and what, uh, what, what Shane Baker is, is doing over there at Wilderness Trail, I mean, you would never know that this stuff is, is on that younger side. It is so rich and flavorful and incredible. Uh, we were really happy with it. Um, uh, then, you know, in between, we got to go to Fourgate. We went hang out with uh, Bobby and Bill from Fourgate. We went to Bobby's house and we were literally drinking 
every new four gate upcoming release that they have coming. And I mean, that was just insane in itself. Um, so I think real quick, uh, what I want to do is taste, taste a couple, a couple of, uh, new whiskeys with you just to kind of give some quick reviews here. Um, so what do I have here that I want to taste with you guys? Uh, okay. Here was one. So uh, this is from Cedar Ridge, which has been making a little bit of noise in the press lately. Uh, so Cedar Ridge is uh, out of Iowa. And I want to thank, I don't think he's in the chat. I don't think I saw him, but, uh, but Big Sexy Travis was able to get me this. This is a uh, Cedar Ridge American single malt. Uh, I've heard amazing things about this. I haven't gotten to try it. So we're going to try a little bit of Cedar Ridge right here. Uh, Steve A says quintessential. That's a nice malt. Here's the label, guys. Uh, focus on that. 92 proof. So this is uh, handcrafted from pure malted barley, aged American oak, uh, and uniquely cask finished. Meticulously married and matured using techniques honed over 10 generations. <laughs> Deep stone fruit balanced by a subtle peat finish. Uh, so this has a little bit of peat in it. So I'm excited to try this one. And America. There it is. Oh, actually smells really good. Um, okay. Yeah, quintessential. Yeah, bring the peat. Oh, man. Guys, that old Carter Batch 9, if you run across it, immediate immediate buy i'm just saying if you're gonna buy one of those i have a batch 10 which is very good too but it's just a little bit more elegant than the old carter batch 9 um it just has a little bit more um uh i mean how do you how do you explain it it kind of has the rough edges like you know in the batch 9 you get all that flavor you get a little bit of that proof it's got a really nice finish has a nice bite to it very flavorful Batch 10 is all of that, but without the rough edges. There's just like an elegance to it uh, in batch 10 uh, where you don't really feel the proof. Batch 10 uh, batch ten comes in at 116.8 compared to the 116.8. So they're the same damn proof. But for whatever reason, batch 10 drinks a lot smoother, uh, you know, for lack of a better term. It just has an elegance to it. Uh, hey, ADHD Whiskey's in the house. What is up? He's popping America. ADHD, how you doing in Colorado, buddy? We just had we just had uh, Greg Metz from Old Elk on the channel, based in Colorado. Um, so uh, hope, your, hope your move is going good, man. I uh, hope you're staying safe and the kids are okay. And, uh, you know, hope to see you again soon, man. We miss you. Um, so let's uh, pour a little bit. This is quintessential. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, man. You go from bourbon to an American single malt. You're uh, <laughs> you're, you're, you're going to get slapped. It's a little bit of a rude awakening, but in a really good way. Oh, my God. This is all peaches to me, like grilled peaches. Apple cinnamon. Slightest hint of like a milk chocolate, not a dark chocolate, more milk. Man, the, the peach is strong with this one. Absolutely. Uh, Golf Whiskey is asking, should I buy this William Lou Weller Old Carter Batch 9? Tough choice. Where does this happen? <laughs> Uh, ADHD is moving again. Yeah, ADHD is now in Colorado. Oh, okay. Been listening the entire time, dude. Great interview. Oh, thanks so much, man. Yeah, that was a lot of fun with Greg. Uh, absolute amazing conversation. I learned I learned a good amount from Greg tonight, which was uh, which. Oh, ADHD sign release today. We'll be in our new place on Saturday. Thanks, everyone. Cheers to Maddie Porter, ADHD world's top whiskey taster, right there, man. Uh. Take a look at in the little booklet on the neck. It's a Solaris setup finished in assorted rum, wine, etc. barrels. Oh, that's good to know, Steve. Eh? Here we. Oh shit! You're not kidding. 
<laughs> uh, peated malt, two row barley, twice distilled, aged in whiskey barrels two to three years, and then aged in whiskey barrels four to five years. Second treatment in a variety of aging barrels, including rum, wood, various fruits and wines, one to two years. Wow, they put this thing through the gamut. No wonder why it's so fruity. Yeah, the um, the sugar, like the powdered sugar rum note is coming through a little bit here. Oh, my God. Uh, Whiskey Central. I, I got to send you some of this shit. You would love it, Shayla Luela. Uh, yeah, that was my favorite part, too. Uh, I love Greg explained the difference in grains, cost, and starch. Yeah, that was easily my favorite part. I mean, that's that's something that – that's an education, and that's something that you're not going to um, – you know, as whiskey tubers, you know, it's fun doing reviews and stuff, but getting that information just makes you a better reviewer, I think. It makes you a better, uh, um, it, it gives you more of an insight to the whiskey. You know, people look at price, they look at what's on the shelf, this costs too much, this costs too much. And, you know, you know, I heard that some people think that Old Elk is maybe a little pricey for what it is, but look what he said, What what's in that mash bill? I mean, to have that much barley in a mash bill for their bourbon it makes sense. I mean, wheat inherently has the same amount of starch as, as corn, he said, but it's also double the price. So a wheater gets to be a little bit more expensive. The bourbon, it's more expensive in its own right. Uh, rye can be a little bit more pricey as well, but um, all this stuff factors into cost and, uh, you know, especially for a new distillery putting out, you know, stuff, but, you know, Greg's smart, man. I mean, that guy, he knows, I he, you know, he knows that he's not going to put any shit out before it's time that it's ready. And now the old elk stuff is coming out, what do you say, five, six years old? I mean, I know I said it earlier, but Bland's is six years old. Everybody goes crazy for that shit. Um, why not try the old elk? I mean, it's it's really good. It's impressive stuff. Um, the wheat content, though, is very different. So if you're used to drinking Weller or Maker's Mark, that weeded bourbon has so much wheat in it. It's very, very different than I would advise all of you guys, if you, you if you have Old Elk weeded bourbon in your area, take that stuff and blind it against Weller and Maker's Mark, and you'll see how different it is. You can even throw Larceny in the mix, um, and you can see how different it is and how much it stands out. It really is incredible. Um, Jason the Wason. <laughs> I'll pay for shipping. I'm not you know, I'm gonna have you pay for shipping. Come on, I'm just gonna send you that shit. Come on. Um, educate me. What does single malt entail? So single malt is a it's generally just malted barley. A single malt is one type of malted barley that's in your distillate, which is what you see in a lot of single malt scotch. Um, but you can also, you know, in Scotland and what we see, you can also have a blended scotch. You could, you know, you have some of the, uh, you know, the blended scotch whiskeys or uh, blended whiskeys overall that can have a few different things in it. But a single malt, you're, you're looking at one single malted barley, uh, you know, bushel that's used to make that product. So that's what we have here. Um, Old Elk wins every time, says Hank Butts. <laughs> Yep, 100% malted barley from a single one distillery. Exactly. So that's the other thing. Bubble bath bourbon brings up a good point. Single malt isn't a protected term in the US, USA yet. Um, it really doesn't mean anything so much in the USA. In, in Scotland, it's like gospel. But in the USA, we don't have legal terms for single malt yet like we do in Scotland. Um, I thought that, you know... Uh, if you guys watch the Scotch Test Dummies, you know, Scott and Bart, that's one thing that they were talking about. Like, we can't wait for single malt to have a legal definition here in the USA. And we still don't have that yet. So, but you have great, great, uh, excuse me, great distilleries making single malt other than Cedar, Cedar Ridge. Virginia Distilling, Stranahan's, you know, Balcones out of Texas, um, you know, just to name a few, you know, making incredible American single malts. So, That's right, guys. Uh, I guess that means that scotch is uh, is a lot more expensive to make than bourbon. I mean, 
Probably. But also remember, Scotland, you know, you can look at Scotland and you can look at the cost of a, of a bourbon and you can, I'm sorry, the cost of a scotch um, or the time it takes to do, to make a scotch. Remember, Scotland, you, you, when it comes to age statements, a lot of people say, oh, it's Scotland, you know, the scotches are, you know, a lot older than bourbon. You know, you get one for 10, 12 years old and, you know, you can get one for 50, 60 bucks on some of the bargain scotches. And, you know, I'd rather have that than bourbon and pay the money for a younger bourbon, especially nowadays. But you got to remember, Scotland's climate is extremely dreary. It's very cloudy. There's a lot of humidity. There's it's generally raining a lot. Um, so it takes the scotch needs that time in the barrel in Scotland. It needs the 10 to 12 years to get to a maturation where it's going to taste good. Whereas bourbon has enough fluctuation uh, throughout the seasons where you can put up, you can put a six, seven year old bourbon up against the 12, 14 year old scotch any day of the week because the, the, the places where they age are extremely different. So uh, Jack Hill, how do you sign up for that old elk giveaway? Just drop a super chat in below. There's a little dollar sign in the chat uh, next to the chat box. You can just kind of fill that. You click that and you can do your giveaway. We're going to do the giveaway here right at 11 o'clock. So uh, I'll give you guys seven more minutes if you guys want to get into the old elk giveaway. Uh, I'm going to give away two bottles of the weeded bourbon because I really think that's their most, uh, as much as I like the blended bourbon, I think their weeded bourbon is really what stands out to me. So two bottles of the weeded bourbon. We'll go to uh, two different winners tonight. Uh, so good luck. Speaking of dreary, is Klein in this chat? I kid, I because I love. <laughs> no, I haven't. I haven't seen him here tonight. Um, Big Vic says, "Yeah, Steve, and that's another thing. Used barrels. Uh, remember when when uh, the bourbon is all done aging, they're usually shipping those barrels to Scotland to age." Uh, use barrels, much calmer climate and whiskey aging terms for sure. So it takes a lot longer for a scotch to be ready than a bourbon. Most of them, most of the time they are not aging in brand new oak. They're aging in used oak. So that's another hurdle that they need to, to, uh, to jump over to get some good age into their whiskey. Top shelf. Dustin says, you got that batch to cast strength from old elk there, Jason. No, not the, I don't have the cast strength, man. Um, but these samples are cast strength, which is the, uh, the picks we're going to do tomorrow, which will be fun. So top shelf dust in the chat. He's the one that helped out with our, uh, our, uh, our heaven Hill barrel pick guys. So mm. holy shit. That's good. Wow. I did not expect that. This, this is just grilled apples, peaches, apricots, apple cinnamon, all kind of dusted on top of that. Wow. And then, yeah, you get a slight little smoke on the very, very back end of it. Also get, again, I get a little bit of that milk chocolate on the back end as well. Um, that's That's really, really nice. Again, this isn't also a punch you in your face single malt. This comes in at only 92 proof. It's very subtle, but very complex at the same time. Mm. Uh, Jason, where do you get that bottle? Uh, so my buddy, um, Travis Wallard, uh, who lives in Iowa, who's a probably the patron saint of Cedar Ridge whiskey, <laughs> uh, grabbed this one for me. So absolutely. Thanks for all the great whiskey tube content. Yeah, absolutely, man. Thank you so much, Byron Hamilton, the Byron Hamilton. Uh, Mike Dallow, the cost of tuition. <laughs> Cheers. Um, yeah, uh, first fill whiskey, two out of two fermenting of sorts, decomposition, all plays into with time. Absolutely. Uh, let's see here. Uh, do you like first fill scotch? Yeah, I, I do like first fill um, I, I generally for a while, I mean, what I'm leaning towards now is I am very, very high on Talisker right now. I'm drinking a lot of Talisker lately. I love the, the salty, the briny, the mix of vanilla caramel and, and it's almost like a salted caramel, 
uh, of flavor that I'm getting. Um, but I mean, I still have not abandoned Bunahaven and of course, Brooklotti, which is my other favorite. So, uh, yes, that's right. His name is Big Sexy in the chat. If you ever see Big Sexy in the chat, that's who uh, got me the bottle. Yeah, Talisker is very nice juice. <laughs> uh, JG says, I had that bottle in my hands today. It was at my Costco and I passed. Now I need to go get it tomorrow. <laughs> Have you tried the 57 North Talisker? First fill whiskey. I have not tried that one. I have the Storm. I have the Dark Storm, which is a uh, travel only release. Uh, I also have the 18 year, which is one of my favorite scotches of all time. Um, and I have a borrowed 25 year from actually Top Shelf Whiskey and uh, and his buddy Mike over at uh, Top Shelf uh, Reviews. So um, that thing is insane. So yeah, John. Uh, John, uh, I don't know if that's if that's Perkley, per Perkle. I'm not sure how you say that. I am knocking on the door 50,000 subs. So that will be an epic celebration. And I tell you guys when I'm opening, when I hit that 50,000 subs, uh, where is it? All right. So here it is, guys. When I hit, when I finally hit 50,000 subscribers, I'm close. I'm knocking on the door. Oh, Black Bourbon family's in the house. Jason and Brandy are here. Raise your drinks up casually. I always got to sing that song when they come in the chat. Just saying. That's what that's what we do. Uh, appreciate the homework you do and the ability to pull names like Nancy F. and Greg M. Speaks volumes about your reputation. Cue up the good work. Yes. I have some more. Uh, I definitely have some more names in the works here. I am trying to get the Master Distiller from Jack Daniels on the channel. We're going to talk all sorts of things about the Jack Daniels Barrel Proof Rye and how the Mass and Journey should get a barrel pick of that. <laughs> I'm just throwing it out there. Probably have a long line of people that want to get in on that pick. <laughs> so uh, so once I hit 50,000 subs, I'm going to open this bottle right here. This is the Wild Turkey American Spirit. Um, and... I'll show you guys the bottle. I think I've showed it before, but in case you haven't seen it, this is my 50,000 sub celebration bottle right here. Um, oh, there it is. I feel like angels start singing when I open this shit. So this is the Wild Turkey American Spirit 15-year-old bourbon right here. This is, uh, I went through a lot to get this bottle and... So this was the first and only bottled and bond bourbon that Wild Turkey ever released before the 17-year bottled and bond that they released last year. So I am saving this one. I am gonna I'm gonna taste this when I hit my 50,000 subs. Uh, so if you know anyone or uh, if you know anyone into whiskey that has not subbed yet, please have them sub, and we'll see if we can get there sooner than later. I'm I'm hoping. I can get there in, um, I'm about, I'm about, I think 1100 subs away, something like that. If I get those 1100 subs in the next couple weeks, you know, two or three weeks, um, yeah, this, this is happening. And not only am I going to open this, but I'm going to give away samples of this shit. So somebody out there can try it because that's what I do. I like to share. I got to put this away before I open it. Just saying. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yep, raise your drinks. Cheers, everyone. <laughs> uh, Burma Wrench, uh, okay. He's talking to Whiskey Mountains. Old Man Joe says, noise. Uh, yeah, 48.8K. I'm close. 1,200 subs away. Uh, it was also the worst tasting and best tasting bottle and bond they ever did before the seven. It's also the worst tasting and best tasting bottle and bond they ever did before the 17 year. Yeah, so that's the thing about that American spirit. I've heard some really weird and different um, uh, reviews on that one. So I'm excited to try that one. I also heard, though, it was also uh, Jimmy Russell's favorite release they ever did. So I'm going to trust in Jimmy. Jason, hopefully in a couple more weeks, I'm like, whoo, I get 10 subs this week. So <laughs> Whiskey Central, your your channel is, is, is growing very, very well. So I would not... Uh, I would not scoff at your growth at all. You're doing a really wonderful job. 
you know, Whiskey Central is kind of, she likes kind of dropping some of that, uh, some history and some knowledge in there too, which I really appreciate. So I'm, I'm right there with you. Hey, Scotch Down Under is here. What's up, 60 Hertz? Uh, it was a special whiskey for me because the first time I had it, I was sitting in the pot still in Glasgow waiting to fly out to Isla. Oh, shit. Um, Bubble Bat Bourbon says 10 subs a week jelly. <laughs> That's right. We all got to start with one, and then we work our way up, guys. Uh, Jason, I'm coming to Columbus this weekend. Where is a good place to go find some bourbon, says Kenny Killingsworth. Uh, on the weekend. The weekends are tough, man, because usually what happens is – we get the deliveries during the week and all the stuff is, is like gone immediately. Um, the weekends are tough because I'm not sure of many. So if you're here on the weekends, Saturday mornings, if you hit up the giant Eagle liquor stores, you might be able to find something good, but you got to get there early to giant Eagle, the giant Eagles that have a liquor store in house. Um, so look up some giant Eagles, wherever you're going to be in Columbus, uh, Saturday mornings, try to get there early and see if they get anything good. Uh, you might get lucky. I know this week they released Colonel Taylor small batch. They had regular Buffalo Trace. They released the Blood Oath Pack 7. Uh, they released the Elijah Craig Barrel Proof, the one I just reviewed today that you guys saw that I was not a fan of. Like, what happened to that fucking Elijah Craig? Uh, that was that was rough. I usually really love the bees, and that one was a big... Um, it's good. It's just, it's just flat. It's kind of a, it's a, it's kind of a flat, but like the, the palate and the flavor goes by so quick. You're kind of wondering what happened, unfortunately. Yeah, not, I don't know if it's the proof because I've had lower proof Elijah Craig barrel proofs before that have been more flavorful. You could have low proof and still have flavor. Uh, the biggest, the biggest representation of that I can tell you is the Woodford Reserve, um, fine, very fine and rare. That's a 90.4 proof bourbon. Granted, there's some 17-year-old bourbon in there. Uh, but, I mean, that has a lot of flavor for a 90.4 proof uh, bourbon. So I just think whatever barrels they batch together just kind of flatten it out, honestly. What the hell is Giant Eagle? I live in Texas. <laughs> Giant Eagle is basically a uh, – it's a it's a food store. It's a – you know, it's where you go to get food. It's like, you know, Wallbaum, Stop and Shop, Kroger. It's a food store. And – there's sometimes liquor stores in some of the Giant Eagles, and you go in there on Saturday mornings, and you can get yourself some bourbon. The Green Lantern ring is peeking out behind your Mass and Drum sign. Uh, is this just your night job to hide your superhero alter ego? That's right. That's right. So, uh, yeah, that that sign is a new sign that, that was made for me. Um, uh, if you guys want to check it out, I'll actually tell you who made it for me. Um, uh, it was uh, Relentless Woodworks. So Relentless Woodworks made that sign for me. I just put some LED lights behind it over the weekend. I think it looks really cool. But, yeah, it's doing the Green Lantern thing. So <laughs> uh, the Mass Syndrome. Uh, Chattanooga Whiskey New Experimental Batch 19. European Oak uh, High Malt. Single source Scottish Spring Barley Malt. Charred European oak, season aged bourbon of four years. Holy shit. I have to reach out to them to try to get some of that shit. What's up, Aaron Lerner? Nice to see you. Scott Center, about to hit 500. Woot, woot. Dude, Ken, you should have a million subscribers for the amount of freaking whiskey you're drinking. That dude, Scott's Down Under, literally did a 24 hour live stream. It's insane. Yeah, the light helps it pop against the wood background. Yeah, I figured to give it a little something, something. So. All right, we're not doing any more uh, super chats. Uh, I don't know if it was um, whoever has the whoever has the names. Either it's Whiskey Mountains or Shale of the Wayla over at Whiskey Central. I'm gonna pick two numbers here to uh, to. So let's see here. Um. So whoever has it, uh, all right, Whiskey Central said, give me a second, lovely. All right, lovely, I got you. All right, so I'm going to pick two numbers here. I'm going to pick, well, first, uh, Whiskey Central, let me know the how many Super Chats we have, one through whatever. 
Uh, Aaron C., did you cover what happened to the other sailor, Kate Douglas? I, 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 honestly, Aaron, we couldn't really get into that, so I couldn't really cover that. That was kind of a, you know, um, couldn't really get into that one, Aaron. I did see your question early on, but that was something we couldn't really talk about, unfortunately. So uh, let's see here. Man, I'm trying to think uh, real quick what I got coming up here on the channel uh, next. Uh, so I am doing my next video. So I got challenged from Whiskey Tornado to do a what's my favorite whiskey in my whiskey room. I mean, and we're we're talking, we're we're taking out price, we're taking out allocation. It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter availability. I have to pick out what my favorite whiskey is in my whiskey room. Over 700 bottles. I have to try to figure out what my favorite is. I'm like, dude, are you crazy? So I have a video I'm working on for that. I do actually have a favorite. And you might really be surprised actually what it is. But uh, I'll let you guys, you guys will see that video soon. Also, I'm doing, I'm bringing the double base back, the heads to heads. Um, I'm going to be doing Calumet 15 versus the old Fitzgerald 16 which I just got when I was at uh, Heaven Hill uh, last week. So that'll be a fun comparison. Uh, it's got everything you want when, he, when you do a head-to-head. -head. It's Weeder versus Rye. It's uh, 100 proof versus 105. It's chill filtered versus non-chill filtered. Um, so uh, I, I'm looking forward to it. It's Barton juice versus Heaven Hill juice. So that should be a fun head-to-head uh, -head as well. Uh, it's Booker's Rye. I wish I had Booker's Rye, man. It's definitely not Booker's Rye. Yeah, the four gate pick is going to be any day now, guys. So we'll uh, we'll definitely let you know all the patrons that are in to get some of our picks. The the four gate pick, the eight year MGP, thirty four day toasted rye whiskey at cast strength is coming very very soon. Um, all right, so Whiskey Mountain said. Uh, so Dark Cove, that didn't take long. <laughs> uh, that might be up there, dude. Shh. <laughs> you would think it might be William the Rueller, but I'm just saying there might be something else you might be forgetting about. Well, you might not know I have it, so we'll see. Uh, one through 50. Okay. So Whiskey Central, give me, um, give me number... So what, B. Sim said it's his birthday tomorrow, right? Which is May 27th. So give me 27 for B. Sim's birthday. 27. Uh, what? Who is number 27 to win the first bottle of Old Elk Weeded Bourbon? Who do we got? Oh, damn, that cedar freaking cedar ridge is good. Damn, that is delicious. <laughs> Number 27 is B. Sims. <laughs> Number 27 is Dennis Boyle. Dennis Boyle, congratulations if you are still watching. Uh, congrats, you just won yourself a bottle of Old Elk Weeded Bourbon. So congrats. Um, uh, Mr. Dennis Boyle, if you're watching, uh, shoot me an email at the and at gmail.com and I will get your bottle out to you. Uh, B Sims, why don't you give me the next number since your birthday's coming up? Pick a number between one and 50 and let me know, uh, what you think there. And obviously you can't pick your birthday number, dude. So, oh, Dennis Boyle, he is the, uh, he's actually a, uh, he's part of the drum line. Congrats, man. Shoot me, a, shoot me an email, themasterdrum at gmail.com, and we'll get you your bottle, Ben. Congrats. <laughs> I also go by the name of Dennis Boyle. Uh, B. Sims is picking number 19. All right, number 19. Whiskey Central, Shayla the Whala. Who is number 19? Hey, Ben Demon Hunter's in the house. What's up, man? Damn, that's good. Is that is that other bottle up here? Oh, I think it is. This is what I'm finishing the night with, guys. Let me clean out my glass a little bit here. All 
I'm finishing the night with a little spring bank 10, guys. That's right. We're going from bourbon to some beautiful scotch, single malt, peated goodness. Oh, man, this isn't even coming out of the damn thing. Oh, did I open this yet? I think it is. Oh, there we go. Oh, Scotland. This doesn't get America. This gets Scotland. Um, Scott Tilton. Scott Tilton wins it. Um, there you go. Scott Tilton. Email the master drum at gmail.com. Congrats. You win yourself a bottle of Old Elk Weeded Bourbon. I'm telling you guys, the Old Elk Weeded Bourbon is one of the more unique and delicious whiskeys that are available out on the market today, especially from a... And did you guys ever see the uh, the tops of the old elk bourbon, like the corks? Look at the look at the cork, guys, real quick. Look, it's like it looks like a piece, like a bark of a tree, and then it's got the cool freaking indentation on top. It just says weeded. Check that out. I mean, that's awesome. I'm telling you, old elk. I mean, he, Greg Metz was serious. They spared no extent, uh, no expense. They had an unlimited budget here. Oh my God, that Springbank 10 local barley is so effing good. It has such a heavy but sweet, like maltiness to it. Almost like Greg Metz was talking about, like that, uh, like when you have like a malted shake. Oh my God, that's so good. Getting like a chocolate in there. You definitely get your fruits, your pineapples here, a little bit of mango I'm getting. Some rich vanillas. Oh, man. This is a hell of a night, guys. So what can I tell you? Congrats to the two winners. Um, yeah, it's a cross cut of an elk antler, which is pretty amazing when you think about the top of that bird. And I think I've seen some of the pics of the special releases actually have like a metal uh, have like a metal uh, antler on top of it, which is crazy, like an elk head. Um, so uh, if you guys want to uh, tune in tomorrow night, uh, we're going to be doing this pick here. We're going to be picking uh, one weeded whiskey and a weeded bourbon. Uh, so that's going to happen tomorrow night right here at 9 o'clock. Going to be tasting, going to be hanging out with Dan and Julie Like. Going to be hanging out with Todd Ritter, myself. Scott from My Bourbon Journey, and also Greg Metz will be back here tonight. If you have any other questions you want to ask him, we're going to be picking our pick for the uh, Mass, and Joan, uh, Mass and Journey Whiskey Club. So I want to thank everyone for tuning in tonight. It was a lot of fun. We learned a lot. Drank some epic whiskeys. Uh, congrats to the winners. Uh, go over to Whiskey Nose. Uh, he's going to be going live right after me. And as I always say, it's not about the whiskey. It's the people you share it with. Cheers. Thanks for hanging out tonight, and uh, hopefully I will see you tomorrow night right here at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. See you guys soon. Cheers. Springbank is the shit. Take care, guys.